You still, are you still there, Scott? Yes, I am. So I'm trying to find my, I can't find it right now. My issue is John Me Magazine with the uh, <clears throat> the article about the big, uh, what was it, Starmus? Was that it? Uh, the big star gathering over in Europe? Oh, yeah, that was cool. Was that was that you on the right hand side of that picture of everybody that was there? It looked like you, was it? I was in the group, one of the group photos. Okay, I thought I picked you out there on the far right, wearing like a white shirt or something, maybe. I don't remember. Anyway, it looked like you. I uh, remembered it was uh, an amazing event. You know, yeah, I can't, I can't there's so much that right goes on at Starmus that I think it really does take a while to digest everything that you, that goes on and everything you see and everything you experience. It's just, uh, you know, you have all these brilliant people, many of them true genius level type people. Mm -hmm. And just to hear their conversations, to hear the presentations, the music, you know, gets infused in all this stuff. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I think that the music itself uh, kind of uh, really drives in uh, the experience it, it makes it so you can't forget it you know so it looked amazing when i saw you there in the picture <laughs> hey little blue come here come on come on come on come on who wants to be on the program Thank you, Bill. Oh, guys. Hey, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the 117th Global Star Party with the theme of From the Big Bang to You. And uh, it is all about the connections uh, that we have with the universe and the universe within. Oh. have a fantastic lineup of speakers and we have a special co-host uh, Carrie Latelier all the way from Chile uh, she's recently back from Iceland where she captured images of the Aurora at which won her a NASA astronomy picture of the day so that was a recent development for her very very amazing and um, anyway she'll be helping us um, uh, introduce our speakers tonight uh, which is uh, David Levy um, uh, comet discoverer and uh, uh, author and also, uh, you know, uh, someone that always gives us inspiring words of wisdom uh, along with special quotes and poetry. So uh, we're always lucky to have David join us. Don Nabb from the Astronomical League will be with us. Uh, David Eichert, senior editor of Astronomy Magazine is here with us uh, talking about exotic deep space objects. Um, Dustin Gibson from OPT uh, recently completed a TED Talk talking about uh, his uh, uh, reasons for getting into astronomy and how he shares that with the world. Uh, Maxi Filari is, is on with us tonight. Uh, he'll be sharing uh, his uh, latest astrophotography and inspiring us all to uh, hook up some sort of camera, um, including when he first came on, a uh, iPhone or a smartphone where he tore the lens out of the system, out of an old one, so that he could just put the sensor right onto the telescope. It's really amazing the shots that he got, and I, I'm always still blown away by his work. Robert Reeves has joined us on an ongoing uh, program of understanding the moon in his program, Postcards from the Moon. If you don't know about Robert Reeves, he does amazing lunar photography but he knows a lot about the surface geology and makeup and history of the moon. So uh, uh, on his last program on our 116th Global Star Party, I learned so much myself. So um, very honored to have uh, the senior astronomer of SETI uh, with us on tonight, 
uh, Seth Shostak, and uh, he'll be talking about life in the universe. Molly Wakeling with Astronomolly, her series ongoing of her astrophotography, where she always mixes in science, uh, love her programs. Marcello Souza from Brazil uh, will be talking about his annual uh, uh, convention and also his astronomy outreach with the youth in astronomy um, uh, down in Brazil. Uh, he is doing some things that are very important and spreading the interest in astronomy all over uh, South America and with us all over the world. Cesar Brolo will be on his balcony tonight, hopefully imaging live. That's, that's, his, that's his plan. Uh, he, is, uh, he does astrophotography from a light polluted balcony in Buenos Aires. And uh, so uh, you'll be surprised what you can get. And uh, his, his um, mission is to get everyone to do astronomy, whether you're in the city or not. Adrian Bradley will be on with us with his beautiful nightscapes. And then we have John Schwartz. We'll finish off the show with Drawing Out the Universe. So thank you for tuning in again, and uh, let's take it away. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight for the 117th Global Star Party. Uh, of course, I'm very happy to have and honored to have Carrie Lutelier be my co-host tonight. Uh, I know she's coming off of a high of uh, winning her first ever NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day. But I'm not surprised because I've been looking at her images now for a couple of years and she does a remarkable job. This is a lady who uh, made it her mission to make her dream come true and uh, think that she might talk a little bit about that. I'm going to turn it over to you, Carrie. Thank you for uh, being our co-host tonight. and. Um, uh, I think we're all going to learn a lot from you and be inspired. Hi, Scott. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so honored that you invited me to, to be your co-host. And yeah, I'm still super excited about the, the, the output. It's, it's like, I don't know, it feels like I, I did get this one step. <clears throat> uh, I really wanted to reach, but there's still a lot to, to learn. I think we all have to keep learning, right? But it's, and as we were talking before with Maxi, it's ironic that I had to travel to the other part of the world from Chile in the very south to the very north to, to make an image that uh, it was pretty interesting enough for NASA to decide, uh, call it an apple, but I'm, so honored by that uh you um i don't know how to explain uh how i feel uh that night when i received the email and they told me hey this is your output please review everything that it's okay the, the summary is okay and i was yelling and screaming and crying a lot like such a girl <laughs> i was like a little girl crying because it's uh, so much hard work it's been five years working in studying and sacrificing like a lot of things, a lot of times with friends, with family, just to be there in the field, practicing, and then in the laptop, practicing my post-processing and trying to, to improve my skills, trying to improve the results. And well, I'm very, how can I say it? I'm so sorry, sometimes my English is, uh, gets a bit rusty, but um, it's exciting to have this recognition. And then that, actually, I wanted to highlight something from the issue from today, because the issue from today is from Big Bang to you. And as in words of um, Scott Roberts, is all this that has to do with this, with our interdependent relationship with the universe. And so I wanted to highlight something that really marked me in the past from a presentation from Scott. Uh, and I took it, I stole it <laughs> and put it here in a slide. Let me show you just that slide that is about the power of stargazing. And from that, 
start understanding about our place in the universe, our place in here, and how this can make us understand um, maybe to not feel so magnificent, maybe to understand that we're so vulnerable. And I really wanted to highlight this, that as humans, we live in a society that tends to focus primarily on ourselves and our lives. I really remember because when I saw this presentation from Scott, it marked me. If, for me, it was different to start connecting all the astronomical uh, polarization with this. We're trying to connect with, with this overview effect. Actually, I, I wanted to put it in here also about that. Ah, and I, I'm using the, one of my time lapse from, <laughs> from Iceland. We really got so lucky by these two uh, solar ejection, solar mass ejections that were so, so, um, how can I say, so great that gave us this show in the night sky. And I, I really wanted to connect this, like we're watching to, to the sky, we're watching to the northern lights in there, we're watching to the stars and trying to understand the different altitudes, the different heights of each phenomena and from them to the stars and to understand this level, this overview effect, this, um, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that I leave it here in Spanish because I translated and I forgot to change it. But if we have someone that speaks Spanish and it's watching in here, it will be easier to <laughs> understand what it says in there. But this, um internal mind uh change of this uh mind thinking right uh help me here scott because yeah, okay i i, I <laughs> learned i learned this from you and i wanted to highlight that well you know you're Karen, the you're the guilty one this is something that i i know that you um uh are very in tune to you know uh astronomy and and looking up and starting to really um, feel the connection or loosening your ego enough so that you can start to wonder and you can start to uh, be awe-inspired. Uh, you know, like I'm looking at this image right now of, of, uh, of the aurora and wow, I mean, if, if, that, if that doesn't blow your mind, okay, just looking at that, um, you know, then, then, you know, you need to stay out there and look up longer. But what it does carry is it makes people have a cognitive shift in their, in their mind and it reframes how they think of themselves in their relationship with the universe, you know? And, and uh, there's many things that happen. They get, they get humbled, they feel like they're very small, like they're very insignificant. That's important <clears throat> to have that feeling, you know? To, and, um, you know, and it opens you up to learning and exploring and when you're exploring and uh, actively exploring, you're experiencing some flow, an experience of flow, and that makes people happy. Exactly. And I think it's a key to, to understand where we come from, right? That we're made of a stardust, and that is not something like something that you read it on your, or your horoscope. horoscope. It's yeah. in English the same, right? <laughs> no, yes. it's because it's a fact. We know about uh, nucleo, uh, nucleogenesis, nucleosynthesis. We know that we came from stars and that everything in here, we know that came from stars. So uh, from there, uh, that we see it like so far away, but we come from there. It's um, that part of feeling maybe, yeah, we're insignificant, we're so small, but and and by that we can understand to leave our ego like in other level. But, exactly. And your problems, your problems also are inconsequential exactly. in the face of the universe, right? So exactly. And what I try to do with this, it's easier for me in Spanish to do it, but it's good here to to practice in, in English <laughs> and to practice my English skills. Um, <laughs> is no to problem. to <laughs> to make people understand that. Besides, they're insignificant, they're so small, they're so uh, not lasting, like we we'll last, I don't know, maybe 100 years, luckily. But what happens with that? That's the only way to make us eternal. 
how's that? Because mm -hmm. we all watch, we, we all get our head up and watch the stars and we're watching exactly or almost the exactly same stars that our parents, our grandparents, and maybe, I don't know what, how, how many generations before of humanity, so exactly the same night sky. And it's what makes us eternal that we're watching exactly the same. And it's the way that we connect with next generations until the end of humanity. And from before, from the very beginning of humanity, we're watching practically the same night sky. And that's something that I, I, I try to highlight uh, what when I try to uh, explain the uh, the overview effect. Uh, Carrie, I have a question. I, I'm really happy that you uh, get this. This looks like it's your presentation that you give to groups in um, uh, South America and uh, maybe in other countries as well. What is the reaction like when when you're when you're talking about this? It's it's different for every person. Um, maybe it has been very interesting with people that are kind of afraid of knowing about the night sky people that have like phobia when they they under a very dark sky and they mm. feel like the stars are coming over them and so they prefer to think that the earth is flat because they don't want to face right. the fact that we have such a vast universe and that there are so many other phenomena they don't want to struggle with that so they prefer to think something minimal so i think that's the most um the most uh how can i say a challenging thing trying to um explain to that people and to understand about the overview effect try to make the overview effect without taking them outside from uh out from the earth right right and so we have many tools for this right to stand about this one is this the family portrait from Bojaga One, right? When it was it was near Neptune, right? Yeah. And from there that Carl Sagan got inspired to 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 write a play of Blue Dot and to show them what how small we are, but the thing is that in that very small dot, we're all part of that. In fact, if we wanted to go to another uh star system. We have to travel like with the the rockets, the actual rockets, the the current rockets that we have. We have to travel. I don't know, maybe during seventy five thousand years or eighty thousand years. It's insane. So, right. how can you uh, get this, in turn this to you and understand that this is like the only place that give you that safety, right? That's what I try to do, use these tools like uh, the family portrait and the Pablo Dot from Carl Sagan on this one, the, the Day the Earth Smile from Cassini, uh, and also astrophotography because I really, I'm really into the landscape astrophotography and that's it's like a discussion always because some people says, no, that's not astrophotography, that's just night photography. But what I say is when you're using that to teach about the sky, to motivate someone to learn about the night sky. And maybe mm -hmm. that person took a photo with his cell phone and start like zooming and zooming and zooming and saw that very, very tiny, like it, it that it looks like dust, but it's a galaxy, for example. And it's, damn, I got a galaxy with my cell phone. Maxi knows about that with yeah, a cell phone, does. right? <laughs> <laughs> and to impress them, that we all can do it. We can all fascinate with nice sky. We can all make landscape astrophotography. It's the easy way to 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 start um, discovering the cosmos, discovering the nice sky, and learning about it. And so another thing that I use a lot, another tool is this quote from this astronaut, the first one from Arabia Saudi, that he says that when they were on the rocket, like leaving the earth the first day or oh, well so we all point to our countries the third or fourth day we were pointing to our continents but the fifth day we were aware of only one earth i'm pretty sure that you use that one right scott yes and i stole it and i stole it i, no, know I, I stole it yeah, i'm a thief sorry it. <laughs> so 
No, but it's, it's, it's collecting such... these ideas and presenting them and reminding people, you know, of their place in the universe, you know, and helping them to reconnect. So many people are lonely, you know, and yet they have everything, their bodies are contain everything in the universe. Exactly. It's so nice that we can use the nice sky, we can use astronomy, we can use astrophotography in every way to start inspiring people. Not just uh, inspired to just take the photo, but to understand what are they catching, that they're catching with their cameras, something that the eye can catch. It's like photographing the visible because it doesn't mean that it's in there because you can't see it. It's that the human eye is not like such a perfect machine, at least without light. That's what I wanted to say to introduce about the, the issue from today, I really, Thought that it was uh, it was necessary to do this connection and to support this um, this uh, this talk that you do also, Scott. This connection that you do with the nice guy that is not mm -hmm. just only about the technical data and like the, the the perfect astrophotography. It's about what is like more far from there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm so honored that now I, I will see all the talks from these older gentlemen in here. Yeah, and I love this time lapse that you have. This is wonderful. Thanks. I can share it to you all, guys, if you need it for a presentation. Just let me know. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, let's go ahead and start introducing our first speaker, Carrie. Yeah, our first speaker, I'm so excited because uh, Actually, you were the first speaker, so the second speaker. Oh, yeah, <laughs> our second speaker, but uh, I was just the introductions, but he's our very first speaker, John. So it's David Levy. Actually, that was maybe my first book to learn about uh, the nice guy, to orient myself with the nice guy. So I'm so honored to present you, David. Welcome. Your your silence. You have to active activate your your microphone. <laughs> that might be better. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, and it's really a pleasure to be hearing you co-hosting today's program. The big from the Big Bang to you. This is a very large theme, but also an extremely personal theme because it goes. It deals with the origins of the universe all the way to us. And there's an important reason for that, because the universe probably has more clusters of galaxies than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of Earth. And um, <clears throat> it is really incredible, unbelievable to imagine the numbers of galaxies, the filaments of galaxies, it's uh, the filaments of superclusters that stretch all the way to the end of the universe. And yet in all that, in that all that, there is only one of each of us. We are unique. Nowhere else in that far-flung universe will you find another Carrie, will you find another David Iker, will you find another Scott Roberts. And uh, it's interesting. So for my poem today, I'm going to read from one of the most beautiful poems ever written, written by T.S. Eliot as part of his four quartets, and it's from Little Golding, and I'm reading it in slightly out of order, but here goes. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. When the tongues of flame are infolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. We shall not cease from exploration. 
and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And Carrie, back to you. Thank you. Thanks to you, David. That was, wow. I was told that too. <laughs> I was saying. <laughs> wow. Come here, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so um, up next, uh, we have, um, we have uh, uh, Don Nab. Don is uh, uh, with the Astronomical League. Um, I, Don, I forget which region that you uh, preside over. The Mideast region. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Pennsylvania, the Virginias, part of New Jersey, and uh, Maryland, and D.C. Okay. Well, that's a that's a big area. And, and how many members are in that area, would you no, say? I don't know. That's about 40 clubs. But 40 clubs. Members, so, uh, but it has the single largest club in the league, which is the Novak, Northern Virginia. In Virginia. There are over 1,000 members, Virginia. just them. Mm -hmm. That's a huge club. So Great. Well, thank you for coming on to Global Star Party. We're going to turn it over to you, man. Okay, well, let me share my screen. I have a uh, couple things to go over. Uh, we'll get the slideshow going. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the moon. Uh, when we picked out some of our, our we, we rotate this among different members of the uh, of the league and sort of pick out things we want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about the moon, some of my favorite things. You know, AL is a lot about outreach, about reaching the public. So uh, some of these things in the moon are a lot of fun to look at with people uh, at public star parties. First thing they want to put a plug in for StarQuest. Anyone within driving distance of West Virginia uh, this summer in June is going to be the Green Bank StarQuest uh, 18. Uh, just want to put a plug in. It's a great event. Uh, my wife and I have been there. We're going again this year. Uh, this is a screen capture from their uh, the website. Uh, it's a really neat place. You, you can camp on the field in sight of the world's largest steerable radio telescope. It's an amazing place to camp. Uh, if you don't like to camp, there's a bunkhouse. Uh, there's a number of thing, events to look at in the in the science center. And every day through the day and at night, there is uh, there are speakers. Uh, you can get lunch. So just want to put a plug in for StarQuest. It's it's a really wonderful event. It's not as big as uh, some of the larger uh, get-togethers, but it's, it's about as big as they get in the uh, Mideast region. So uh, uh, June 21, 24, and you have until Friday to sign up and get the early bird uh, registration reduced cost. So, uh, but again, it's, this is, this is, I took this picture from our camping site and just to have this device out there every day through the night looking at this thing, it's an amazing, experience. So just put in a plug in for StarQuest. Excellent. So the moon, you know, it's it's full of amazing sights. And at when we have night sky events, we try to schedule them where there's a little bit of moon, but not too much so it doesn't wash out other things in the sky. Uh, but you know, even the simplest telescope can give you good views of the moon. Uh, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things uh, that that we really enjoy sharing about the moon. And one of my favorites is Rupus Recta, the straight wall. And that is this, okay? And every month you can see this, okay? Uh, it's around day eight or so, day or so after first quarter, and it's the uh, the most well-known fault, normal fault on the moon. And you'll be able to see it day after tomorrow, uh, March 30th. So, you know, this is the current moon. Now, Rupus Recta is right around in here. So it's a little bit beyond first quarter. Uh, you know, when the moon was molten uh, and started to cool, uh, impacts from large bodies caused these maria, the seas. Uh, but the, moon, the uh, straight wall formed after that. When things were cooling and you had tension and compression forces, this to make the moon looking pretty much like it is. So I tell to think of the moon cooling. Sometimes you take a pie out of the oven. 
and it looks really great when you take it out, but when it's full, you got big cracks in it. Well, that's what happened to the moon to some extent. So, so normal faults are where the crust is pulled apart and gravity pulls down one part of it, exposing a fault scarp called a rupus. And uh, rupus recta, this great wall, is the best example of a normal fault with the moon. Uh, so when the sun illuminates it about day eight, casts the shadow, it looks like a steep cliff. So, you know, 110 kilometers, so you could drive from one end to the other at interstate speed and be there in an hour from one end to the other. So it's not really that large, but it, it's just a wonderful sight in the telescope for people who've never seen it. And, you know, it may look like a vertical cliff, but this shot from Apollo 16 shows that it's really not a steep cliff. It's actually fairly shallow. It's just that the moon is just coming up uh, and lunar sunrise, and so it looks like a very, very steep drop off when it's really not. So, a couple of other things to point out. Um, here is a uh, crater Burt, 70 kilometers diameter, what's that, about 10 miles or so. And you may say, well, what's this? Is this another straight wall? No, this is actually a rim of Burt Rill, a okay, German for groove, that's what Rill is. and. Uh, this is a groove as opposed to a cliff, which we have here. Um, it's not from a fault, it's from erosive forces. It was lava flowing from one spot to another that causes this. So it's a great little pair of, uh, of uh, objects to look at on the moon. And then down the southern end here, they call this the Staghorns Mountains. That's just an informal name. <clears throat> it's not, not recognized by the IAU. The other, probably my favorite thing on the moon, it's the Lunar X, and the next favorite is Lunar V. So it's near, you can probably barely see it here, but I'll point this out a little bit more. It's near Crater, crater Vern. With binoculars or telescope, you can see this. It's a distinct X on the moon. Now, the V is not quite as distinct, but what it has going for it, where this is only visible for a short time, the V stands out for a, a little bit longer than, than the X. So you may have a day or two to see the V, the X, you have about four hours. So this is a little blown up section. Actually, I took this photo a few years ago. Um, this is the, uh, the X and then the V. It's a little harder to see, but there is the V. Okay. Um, oh, it's yeah. just one, just right at first, just beyond first quarter when the, uh, the sun is just catching the tops of these peaks. So, and they're not real. They're not real. They're an optical illusion. And uh, uh, for the lunar X, it only lasts about four hours. And unless your 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 part of the Earth is pointing at the Moon during those four hours, you're not going to see it. Uh, straight wall, on the other hand, you'll see every month. It's always there. But the lunar X is fleeting. Uh, we've had in our astronomy club local, we've had lunar X parties, which are a lot of fun. Uh, you can watch this thing, it starts to get lit and go through a period of hours and see the X and eventually disappears. So this year is really favoring the Western US. Now, if you were in California last night at 1 a.m., you could have seen the Lunar X. Uh, but so in May and July, September, all these favor the Western US. Uh, they'll be probably visible for a little longer and maybe you'll catch it in the East on these days. But these are the confirmed sightings in the U.S. in the Western U.S. in during 2023. You know, the Lunar X is an example of. See if I can pronounce this right. Pareidolia, okay, pareidolia. It's a tendency of the human mind to find patterns, something familiar, in uh, when we're looking at things, uh, random patterns. This is probably the most famous example or pareidolia is the. Uh, the famous space on Mars, where uh, everyone said, wow, the aliens built this. Well, as NASA had better views, it found out that it's just a mountain. That's all it is. So, but that's what the lunar and X and the VR, just an example of the brain wants to find patterns. It's, it's what we do. A large portion of our, a significant part of our brain is centered on pattern recognition, mostly so we recognize faces. Okay. Uh, so if you like, uh, Lunar observing, the uh, Astronomical League does have a lunar observing program. Uh, this is one of the first programs back. It may be the first program that I completed, that or the Constellation Hunter. But you can go to the Astronomical League, the lunar observing program. It's a really fun one. 
You might recognize this guy's name down here, Chuck Allen, who is also on the show. He is the coordinator of the Lunar Observing Program. And um, you earn a, uh, a certificate or a nice pin. I actually have mine right here that uh, I wore this last night. We're teaching astronomy classes right now. I wore this. And the good thing is with the certificate, if someone tells you they think you're crazy, you can tell them you are a certified lunatic. You have the paperwork to prove it. It's good. One last thing I want to mention that we do have on uh, April. Uh, it's hard for me to see because the, uh, the header is covering this. I think it's April 28th. We do have Astronomical League Live. Uh, Michael Balchik will be presenting uh, the total solar eclipse. The countdown has begun. All right, I think I'll stop my sharing. That's pretty much what I had to cover. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Don. I, I didn't know that you were such an expert on the moon. Um, I'm a certified lunatic. You are. You are. Uh, uh, Carrie, do you, uh, uh, do you do much photography of the moon yourself? Not much. I would really like to, to, to learn how to do it, but I don't do much moon photography. Actually, I'm hiding from uh, full moon. I try to always go astrophotography without moon. <laughs> to avoid it. Yeah, most deep sky enthusiasts do that. You know, I did too for a long, long time. But I've grown to really appreciate the moon. And uh, it's something that I can look at, um, you know, any time that it's up. Uh, I, I think my best view of the moon ever was looking through the 60 inch Oscar Mayer telescope at Palomar Observatory. Uh, and they had it powered up. And Carrie uh, and Don, they had this line from the, uh, the astronomy club I was with. I'm not going to call them out right now, but I thought it was very strange that all of them were avoiding looking through this massive 60 inch telescope at the moon, you know? And they just had an eyepiece just sticking straight out the back of it. So the light coming out of it looked like a spotlight hitting the floor. <laughs> and um, people were going, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt my eye. I'm going to damage my eye. And I was like, get out of my way. I want to see this, you know. <laughs> and uh, it, Don, uh, Gary, it was beautiful because the, you could see what looked like undulating hills and, and this kind of thing on the moon. It was just... Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's burning my brain. I can't. I can't get it out. And uh, Terminator is amazing. Yeah, it's it is amazing. But uh, uh, thank you for coming on tonight, Don and uh, uh, Carrie. And I are going to introduce Dave Iker. So yeah, and I actually have a, a question for David. For when... uh oh, yeah, yeah. I no, but I do have. A, I have a question for the end of the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would like to know which one is your favorite of the weird or the bizarre stars. <laughs> Part of these exotic deep sky objects. Of, of which is the favorite weird deep sky? I have to think about that yeah. as I as I speak a little bit here. There's so many favorites, but I'll, but I'll think <laughs> about that for a moment here. Um, but but it's a great pleasure to meet you finally, and and uh, please do send uh, Astronomy Magazine some of your images too, and we will publish them. Too well. Enjoy. Really? Oh, of course. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh so my gosh. It's great to make your acquaintance. And uh, I have Scott. I think we're through ten exotic objects we've talked about, and they're four hundred and twenty-one to go. So we're oh, not quite there yet. You, you know, really we knocked that list down. You know, but so. we've got to start at least a little bit of talking about them, and we'll keep going on that. But I thought talking about with the Big Bang Theory theme. I thought yeah. it would be a good time to kind of stop for a moment and talk a little bit uh, tonight about, you know, how do we think about scientific ideas, really? Because it's a funny thing. Astronomy enthusiasts are science-minded, and they're very logical, and they're deeply enthused. And Carrie, as you described, this connection we have with the, the universe and understanding that the elements that we're made of were created in the the, essentially mostly the deaths of stars and in the early universe, you know, but there, there's a weird thing with some astronomy enthusiasts with the Big Bang. Well, I don't know, you know, really about the Big Bang. I'm a little skeptical about that. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, it's kind of a weird blind spot with a lot of people who are, 
and I hope I don't upset anyone who are otherwise normal and and intelligent, you know. So so um, I, I thought maybe we just take a moment tonight to talk a little bit about you know how do we think about scientific ideas just for a moment, and then I'll get to an exotic object. Yeah. If, well, if David, you'll... I mean something yeah. that often comes up, you know. Uh, when there's conversations like that, somebody will say, well, my theory is this, and they blah, blah, you know, and then they yes. have their, and they're interesting ideas, of course, you know, and it's, it's not anything that you'd laugh at or anything like that, but uh, yeah. what, what, I recently read about, you know, what is a theory? How does it become a theory? How does it go from an idea to a theory, you know? And I was following along uh, the, history i was trying to find out what the history of the theory of the big bang was so well it's got it's funny you should ask that because that leads right into exactly what i was going to start to talk about it's not like scott and i rehearsed this or anything no, okay, but, not at all. no we would never do such a thing as that but let me let me share my screen if I can, uh -oh, I need to get back to there. Share share my screen for a moment, and I will start uh, to put a slideshow on. And can you see a couple of uh, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that are interacting? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. that has nothing to do with anything. Pay no attention to that whatsoever. Okay, <laughs> just get that out of your mind immediately. But if I can toggle through. Let's talk for a moment about the Big Bang and the word theory, because uh, Scott, as you said, most people use the word theory. I, I have an idea. Let me. I have a theory about how this works. But scientists think of these words in very special ways that we should remind ourselves about once in a while, because it's easy for all of us to kind of fall out of that. So a theory for scientists is an accepted generalization regarded by scientists as correct and true based on substantiated evidence. It's often misused, as we just said, by the lay public, taken as a working idea. Modern theories, however, include evolution. And if you have friends who are skeptical about evolution, by the way, you can remind them, if you'd like to, that that was breaking news 164 years ago. Um, the theory of radioactivity, uh, the theory of relativity, of course, and the Big Bang theory, uh, which sort of came to the fore with, with Hubble and even earlier than Hubble with Vesto Slipher at Lowell Observatory uh, in the era of World War I. Theories must be accepted according to science until they are revised or replaced by new research. They're compilations of ideas that are worked on and proven uh, to a high degree uh, by observations and experiments many, many, many times. And of course, when we're talking about the era of science, we're talking about approximately the last 500 years since about the time of Galileo. So if we step back from theory, a hypothesis from the word hypo meaning less and thesis meaning theory is an educated working guess or a set of ideas in development to explain various phenomena. So a hypothesis may turn out to be true or false pending further information, investigation and analysis. This is what most people mean when they say the word theory, a working hypothesis. Then uh, in science, laws, scientific laws may uh, be rather specific and expressed in logical or mathematical forms. Examples, for, for example, there we have Kepler's laws in astronomy, uh, the law of gravitation in physics, kinetic gas laws in chemistry, the quantum laws of atomic motion in physics. Scientists use these methods to define principles which are tested repeatedly by observation, experimentation, theory, and analysis. And they construct a view of the world uh, that they believe to represent uh, most accurately reality and how we understand it. So, the development of ideas for scientists goes from hypothesis to theory, to law. 
And it's good to remind ourselves of, of that every once in a while. And forgive me for being on a soapbox a little bit about this, but this is the kind of thing that I was harangued with as a youngster because my father, among other things, liked to teach the philosophy of science. So it's good to remind ourselves of this. So the Big Bang Theory, which originated with the discoveries by Hubble of the nature of galaxies with the Andromeda Galaxy in 1923, and even before Hubble with VM Slipher, as I said, with his fancy new spectroscope, which you can see out at Lowell still in 1912, discovering that the spiral nebulae were all uh, radial uh, in radial velocity moving away from each other. Uh, uh, that, that was a working hypothesis. Then along came Arno Penzias and our friend Bob Wilson, who's still around, uh, and uh, with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1964, the Big Bang became reality, and that was really verified. And we've had an enormous amount of verification of the Big Bang, or the singularity, if you will, as the origin of the universe, with this whole series of cosmological satellites that we've had, starting with COBE in 1992, and most recently with the uh, Planck satellite, uh, with its last big data dump that was in the year 2015. So now we have to say that the Big Bang was the origin of the universe. And if you want to be a rebel and think you have your own theories or, or hypotheses, if you will, you really kind of have to accept the Big Bang. You can't accept science and scientific thinking part of the time, but not when you choose to exclude it. You know, that's not the way science works. So there's my soapbox for the night. And if I can get this thing, there we go. So now I'll go on this one. That is the process, you know, that is the scientific process. Yeah, and, and Scott, I don't know if you have thoughts about um, the Big Bang or about theory and hypothesis. You were, we were talking about this just for a minute earlier today a bit, and, and you were very interested in, in this yeah. as well. Yeah, and so I, you know, uh, I just, when I'm reading about, um, you know, things like the Big Bang and other concepts that where they're trying to peer into the the very nature of of the universe uh words like theory and hypothesis get interchanged so much that you're like well is it a hypothesis or is it a theory or do, it do is a hypothesis equal to a theory you know hmm. at what point you know, does does something become established as a theory? Is it is it kind of like in hindsight after they, you know, many experiments are run that are different kinds of experiments, uh, such as the ones that um, put uh, uh, the Big Bang on its mantle of where it is now. You know, um, yeah. In 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 a in a word, yes, and and that can be debated a little bit. You know, where exactly are these lines? But but in in essence, yes, you're exactly right. Uh, the hypothesis is our our you know educated guess, and it's what we think we think this is going on because we have some observations and evidence and experiments that we've run, and they all seem to come back from all the different groups uh, the same way, and so we think this is the way it works. But of course, with big complex ideas, like some of them that we mentioned there, including the Big Bang, it takes decades at least, um, sometimes to kind of really accumulate the evidence that does make it out to what is generally agreed to be a theory, that we think this set of principles explains how this works, and there's an enormous amount of evidence for it. Then we can go that step beyond, and ever since you know Galileo and Newton, we have very high confidence in gravitation and how it works, you know, and, and, you know, dropping things out of, you know, the, you know, the Campanile, you know, and watching them fall at, at various rates. Um, and the, the laws and, and uh, you know, in, in more recent times, you know, relativity is, is now, um, you know, don't bet against Einstein. Yeah, Every yeah, yeah. time, you know, we do relativity, I'm sorry. 
I said the people, the scientists keep trying to prove him wrong, but, uh, you know, there's some other new experiment that comes along and boom, Einstein wins again, you know, so. That's right. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's, you know, relativity is, is up there as well among some others that we think are fundamentally absolutely correct. And the problem is, as we go through time, you know, if we're talking about antiquity, we're not talking about science, really. We're, we're talking about some basic ideas that are clouded in various ways. The era of modern science really starts with Galileo, you know, over about the last 500 years, approximately. So a framework of, you know, of understanding things better it's always, we, we see the universe always, and not to go on forever about this, but there's a great book that Bob Jastrow wrote years ago that, that I'll throw on here a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, that is a good, it's a little bit outdated now, it's from the 1970s, but his estimation then was that, you know, maybe we know about, maybe perhaps about 20% of the phenomena in the universe. So, the history of science is a self-correcting process, thankfully, but it's also a process in which we understand the universe in too simplistic a way at the start. And one example of that is, for example, with just in astronomy, um, you know, Martin Schmidt, and we're about to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the discovery of quasars. And which were very distant, very energetic, extremely bright star-like objects that were completely not understood at all in the early 1960s, 1963 at Caltech, when 3C48 and 3C273 and others were first noted as radio objects at first. Um, and then for 25 years, this mystery went on and we had quasars and we had B.L. Lacerda objects and we had Seifert galaxies named after Carl Seifert and all these weird, unrelated things that were high energy objects. And we, how are we ever going to figure this out? This went on into the late 1980s. And then suddenly with Hubble in the early 1990s, it became clear that these were all the same phenomenon but with different geometric angles that we were viewing them from and different individual characteristics. But they were all phenomena that were related to black holes in high energy in, in the early part of the universe. So for, you know, it can take us a long time to kind of get clarity and figure things out for bits of hypothesis to get into a confident theory, if you will, because it's a complex universe. But eventually we tend to do that uh, over time. Now, of course, the good thing for astronomers and other scientists is that for everything we figure out, we generally uncover a few more mysteries that we didn't realize were out there. So nobody's going to run out of a job, you know, tomorrow um, in terms of investigating science. But it is a slow, self-correcting process. But I think we do need to have merit in what we have truly discovered and have high confidence in things like gravitation and relativity, and I would say the Big Bang as well. Right. Excellent. So sorry to go on so long about that. I didn't intend to quite do that, but but it's a bit of a complicated though, mess. It, many people kind of toss the, this, these ideas around and really only have a cursory understanding of the process of science, you know. Yet, as you say, many of us as amateur astronomers will hold, you know, science up as a, as, as a very uh, important uh, aspect of humanity, um, you know. But, uh, of course, we might have a pet idea that we retreat to that really doesn't uh, follow the process of science. Well, and there are other, this goes into, there's a whole nother realm of, you know, how do you determine what you believe to be the truth or reality? You know, and, and empiricism, scientists think is the best way, you know, but but there's also, you know, listening to what authorities tell you, you know, um, yeah. parents, school teachers, who, clergy, whomever, you know, associates, there's intuition, you know, I feel that this has to be right. There's long ago, you know, a lot of the majority opinion of, of how do you view the world 
about you around you uh, was dictated by things that you dreamed, you know, and that tends to be a less reliable method now than science. Right. We think so. <laughs> anyway, we, there's there are hours of stuff to talk about with all of that too, right. but this, this, this and it's on. and I don't want to have it come off that you know because we think we know some things in an absolute way. You know, five hundred years is not very long hanging around on a planet. You know, so you know it's not like we don't have enormous, incredible things and many, many of them to discover and to figure out yet. But that be, what we don't know yet doesn't necessarily automatically negate. There are people who say, well, you don't know everything as scientists, so nothing that you know is probably reliable. That's not true either. You know, we believe that gravity and the experience of gravity working uh, is, is reliably known and has been for millions and millions of experiments over, in, the, in its case, hundreds of years. And, you know... The people who really feel that gravity is suspect, you know, probably aren't likely to, you know, step outside of a window, you know, either as a test, you know, that usually doesn't work out too well, you know. So anyway, you could go on forever about this stuff, but I think it's important to remember those terms and how scientists really use them because they get corrupted so much uh, outside of the realm of kind of science enthusiasts, if you will, you know. Right. So, Carrie, this one is not my favorite exotic object. <laughs> to me, it's just the next one, you know, in line. In fact, but, you hate this one, right? <laughs> but it's an interesting one. This, this is not the greatest. <laughs> um, oh. But it's okay to start with the one that is not the, the, the favorite one. Well, and to, to finish we, with the, the favorite one. Like, exactly. And pretend and, and as a confession, I went through lots and lots of sources and started through no particular reason going through star atlases near the North Pole, and I'm working my way southward. So actually, as you know, undoubtedly in Chile, a lot of the good stuff is in the southern sky, you know, but but so we northerners are a little bit envious of the southern hemisphere that you have all the time. You know, you're all welcome here in Chile whenever you want to come. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. <laughs> well, Bart, you know, an old friend, Bart Bach, you know, David knows this better than anyone, used to say all the good stuff is in the southern sky. That wasn't too much of an exaggeration, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this one is in the northern, far northern sky, and it's Coddington's Nebula. It was discovered in 1898 by an American astronomer, Edward Coddington, and it's not a nebula at all, but this was before 1923 when all that fuzzy stuff, you know, was in, were called nebulae. This is actually a dwarf barred spiral galaxy. Um, and it, it was identified later on. It's in Ursa Major. It's about 13 million light years away. And it has, among other things, an enormous number of very large star forming regions. Uh, the diameters of some of its H2 regions are as large as 500 light years across, enormous star forming regions. Um, so it's a relatively young galaxy, among other things, which explains that uh, stellar population. It's an outlying member of the M81 group, which is one of the closest groups, small groups of galaxies. Remember, there are big clusters of galaxies throughout the universe. The nearest one to us is the Virgo cluster, but there are even more galaxies that are in small groups of several to a couple dozen. Um, and this group has M81 and M82, of course, and another really nice spiral NGC 2403 in Camelopardalus, you might know, and then a couple dozen other galaxies as well. About 90% of the mass of this object, Coddington's Nebula or galaxy, is in the form of dark matter. Uh, and it's about an 11th magnitude object that's reasonably large. It's about 12 arc minutes across, but it has a very low surface brightness. So it's, it's a little uh, challenging to observe. And if I can get, come on, there we go. Okay, this is my old current favorite star atlas, again, the Interstellarum. 
atlas. And here you can see Coddington's Nebula. It's in a field of northern Ursa Major, and there are a few clusters and, and a couple of interesting variable stars nearby it, uh, but not a whole lot else. And this is a kind of a good representation, uh, except for the color, um, as, of how Coddington's Nebula appears in a medium size to, to large telescope in, in your backyard in a dark sky. You know, it's kind of an interesting galaxy. And even here, you can see some of the H2 regions with stars forming. Here's a higher resolution, somewhat close, uh, more close up view of the object. And you can see it's just studded with star forming regions, which is quite uh, incredible. Um, and NGC 2403, also in this group, has a lot of star forming regions as well. Here's a Hubble image of a portion of Coddington's nebula. Uh, and you can see it's just a wall of sort of faint stars here with some of those H2 regions uh, shown pretty well. Um, this is not the whole galaxy, of course, but a segment of it in the field of HST. Uh, and just as an outgoing reminder here, I'll, I'll mention that astronomy, we're in our, the midst of our 50th anniversary year, which was kicked off with a comets issue by none other than Professor David Levy introducing it. Uh, and we're looking forward to all sorts of other special surprises and a big anniversary issue in August, which is actually the anniversary month. So that's coming down the pike. Also, uh, Don mentioned a couple things of interest. Uh, one of them was Michael Bakich uh, is going to give a talk uh, for one of the league sessions. I'll mention uh, he and I wrote this book recently, uh, Child's Introduction to Space Exploration. And Don, I thought that uh, hearing one thing you said, that's the greatest uh, uh, sort of um, theme, Scott, for a, a show that you have coming up. I think next time we should all bring our toasters near yes. the laptops here. And whomever toasts a piece of bread during the show to look most like a spiral galaxy, <laughs> we can sell it on eBay for half a million dollars. Half a million. I'm sure. You know, so there we go. So that's what I have, and, and sorry, I didn't mean to go on quite so long um, about the philosophy of science, but it's good to remind ourselves of that. And one more um, strange special image, you know, of, of an exotic sky object. You know, it's a bright one, Carrie, but I'll just throw back uh, as an immediate response to that. For a northerner, when I'm down in Costa Rica or in Chile or somewhere else in the southern hemisphere, when you look up and you're used to the Orion Nebula as a great, incredibly bright uh, star forming region, and you see it and it's over here, you know, kind of moving down towards setting and, you know, it's fairly small but bright and beautiful in the naked eye and, you know, one of Scott's telescopes, in fact, we've had there a 16 inch uh, Dob, you know, and it's incredible in the telescope. Then you look over here and you see the Carina Nebula rising, and it's about five times larger and four times brighter than the Orion. And you think, holy God, that's a nebula, you know. So that's my favorite uh, nebula that's sticking in my mind tonight, the Carina Nebula. Well, that's actually such a, uh, in here, it's like one of the most photographed nebula. I think that all my friends that do deep sky astrophotography, they all have uh, like three or four versions of Karina, like with Hubble, Palette, with uh, the SHO. They have it like in all the ways, because as we have it like almost all the nights and the whole night. <laughs> oh. Fantastic. Well, you're you're on the right place on Earth, you know, for deep sky observing. There's no doubt about that. And you know, it's by far the largest and brightest nebula in the sky. So I'm looking forward to the time when I can come down to Chile and visit again and and see it again. Jen, we have to go to Atacama to the best night sky. Absolutely. It's yes. The driest one. Yes. You I bet. will introduce. Yeah, I will introduce you my best friend. He's uh this deep sky astrophotographer and i know that you will get along like fantastic i, I look forward to that <laughs> and I will 
dream of the Karina Nebula later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I will send you my friends, Karina Nebula, the last one he made. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thanks Scott. Thanks to you. And so for our next guest is Dustin, Dustin Gibson. He just released during uh, 2022, right? A TED Talk. And um, hi yeah, there, that's, Dustin. That's right. I'm not sure if I got audio yet, but yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> How we doing? Yeah, I, I don't want to do a spoiler. I just... <laughs> sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it uh it was recorded actually in August, but it just got released a few weeks ago and it was um uh, a great experience. One of the one of the scariest experiences of my life as I've called Scott a couple times now to tell him because my goal tonight, you know, in in coming here is to get everybody to petition to get Scott to do one of these things. I was trying <laughs> to push him into this or something like this very soon. I think Scott is such a juggernaut for the mission and in sharing astronomy for everyone. And, you know, tonight's a good example of that, that I just think, um, you know, it's it's where we need to, where we need to push him. We need to get as a group and just push Scott. Push me into right off the things. cliff into the TED Talk world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's where you belong. Well, that's great. Well, I, you know, I, I watched your TED talk. It was really impressive, really inspiring. You said you were nervous and uh, very, yeah. Uh, you didn't show it. You know, I mean, it was it was uh, it was brilliant and inspiring. And I encourage all of you that are watching right now, um, you know, to Google Dustin Gibson TEDx. You know, you're going to find it right off the right off the top and. Uh, Google has had tens of thousands of views already and uh, maybe upwards of 100,000 views, maybe. And, um, um, you know, it is, uh, I love the story of uh, how you got started and where, it, where it's all led to. But I'll let you tell the story. Well, it's hard to it's hard to follow up David for one thing. So <laughs> it, it's not really fair that you put me in this spot. I saw when you sent me the email, I was like, oh, come on, Scott. We've been friends a long time. You're going to make yeah, me follow well, up David. You know, you're a TED Talk guy now. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, it's scary because it's it's obviously, I mean, we've we've been saying this all the way back to our podcast four years ago that we did together. Yeah. But it's just this mission feels really important. It's something that is obviously perspective shaping. Once you get astronomy in your blood, you never get it out. You can't. It's just once you have that perspective, you can't, you know, you can't see the rest of the world the same way ever again. You can't see your own life. You can't see your place in the universe. You can't see anything the same way. And so it felt very important. Um, I actually tried. So when they when they contacted me about it, I tried to push the talk off on one of my partners um several times um and they decided not to do it so i accepted it and then you know the hard part is they make you memorize it so no teleprompter um it has to be exactly 18 minutes you know they like they do this whole thing and um you know you can't you can't go up there with notes or anything and it was just it was very intimidating most talks when you go up you have like your slides and so you can just kind of pull because they're they're refreshers, you know, it right. reminds you of what your next point was. And then you can, if it's something you know well, you can just riff off of the slide. But That's going right. up and memorizing it, it felt like, you know, I'm not talking about this, I'm I'm pulling from memory and in front of several thousand people at the time. Right. <laughs> you know, it was this huge, huge <laughs> facility. And so, yeah, it was intimidating, man. It's not, um, I'm not really built for those types of things, but it felt important well, to do. Well, you was, are, so you did it and you did a great job, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it feels important, it, you know, and I, I hope that there are more far better ones than mine, you know, in the near future. I think that it's an important message. I think these types of, um, you know, this this content, even that you're putting out, this this stuff is evergreen. So it's here tonight, obviously, for all of us to enjoy live, but it doesn't go away tomorrow. And right. so it's still going to be here. And this is a chance for people to hang out with some of the, the greatest minds that, you know, they're, they're ever going to have a chance to. And alongside that, it's all people that love astronomy as much as we do. And we've pretty much gone as far down the rabbit hole, I think, as you can. So, you know, that's saying, saying a lot, but uh, no, man, I think it's really great. And I think that, uh, 
you know, space, we're seeing it more and more because of social media, because of these, these large vehicles mm -hmm. for audiences, you know, it's, it's just growing rapidly, more rapidly than I think any of us ever could have imagined. It's and mainly maybe, because of astrophotography. Yeah, maybe more rapidly than any time in humanity, you know, so I, there, that's the uh, there's certainly, you know, the, the, there's, there's those of us that are, have not had the, uh, the astronomy experience yet, but um, yeah. uh, there are more people like yourself uh, who are doing um, outreach in astronomy, uh, you know, and um, I think people like yourself, uh, and, and Carrie's another example, in fact, all the people that are on Global Star Party are prime examples of people that have uh, made a change in their lives to um, uh, continue on the exploration. They're on this journey and all the rest of it, but they are turning on all these other people onto it. So it's it is a uh, um, it is uh, it's important, and I think for a lot right. of us, it's a mission for us. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's it's one of those things. I think that um, you know it it really started at least for me. You know, I got into visual astronomy first. I know you still do quite a bit of visual astronomy, yeah. and I still. I still love it. You know, I have a daub here that I still use all the time. I just I've never got for visual. You know, it's like I love refractors for the contrast they give you. They're just perfect telescopes for visual, but also daubs. Just you can get so much aperture, you know, for the money with daubs. And then you just get these big views of things that otherwise you'd never be able to see. I love visual astronomy, but the problem with visual astronomy is it's not it's not really a shareable experience the way that astrophotography is. I mean, it is in the sense that you can get these amazing views that excitement is contagious but you're limited to whatever your ability to go out and explain what it is you saw to somebody you can explain the galaxy or try to describe it the best you can maybe draw it if you're talented in that way but with astrophotography there's none of that necessary it's like you take the photo you have a high resolution image with more detail than you would have seen visually in most cases especially with narrowband filters with emission nebulae and it's like you're not limited to the 1 60th or 1 30th of a second of the human eye exposure you can capture as much light as you want for as long as you want and then put this image out there that then shares it in a more meaningful capacity i feel like than what any of us are limited to with our explanations of it and i think that's what's changing is that cameras have gotten better telescopes and cameras both have gotten less expensive um and you know quality goes up cost goes down so the barrier for entry is far lower which means more people can do it and on top of that it's being shared through social media in a way that's not descriptive but instead you know it's illuminated through imagery and i think that's what that's what really lit the fire for the explosion of astronomy interest that and then of course things like james webb and the other amazing um, advances that have been made but the more that people put this stuff out there again it's evergreen content people can find it at three o'clock in the morning so i think that um you know it's going to continue that direction and i i would be very very surprised if we don't see this be something that we see more and more talks being done on large large oh, stages yeah. and large scale talks and uh, you know, mass media even picking up a lot of coverage of this stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, you know, uh, definitely you have, uh, I, I think, done, uh, you know, a wonderful job of explaining uh, to people what this shift is like and and how that can really affect someone's life. Um, um, and you have turned on many, many people through your podcast, through uh, your, your video blogs, uh, uh, that you did uh, as well and that you continue to do. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what are next steps for you? What, what do you envision, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road? What are you doing with all of this? So for me personally, or where do I see the industry? You personally. Me personally? Uh, yeah. yeah. So we've got uh, multiple businesses in astronomy right now. There's one that, uh, you know, we've, we've, started that uh is called our sky that you know we're, we're really excited about trying to share this on a larger scale that incorporates ai i think ai just like with everything i mean it's going to be the future of a lot of this not just yeah. with data acquisition but data identification which objects there are actually of important value um all of that stuff it's really hard to sort through the data i mean universities gather a lot of data 
But the problem we hear is often the same, which is just once we have all of this, what do we do with these terabytes right. of data? Who's going to sort through it all? Right. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is where I live, man, is in this space with uh, astronomy. And so trying to share this, my personal mission, I mean, those are professional missions. My personal mission is, uh, you know, to just make it accessible. And that's what a lot of the TED, TED, uh, TEDx talk was about, is just creating access to this, sharing it and making it something for people that otherwise would never have had access, which is where I was for 27 years of my life. Um, you know, creating that first instance that can be life changing, where somebody can see something for the first time, the things we all start to take for granted, like seeing the moon for the first time through a telescope right. or that's right, anything, anything, you know, that simple, it's creating access to those things. So I've been working with um, local cities and uh, universities to build observatories, and then give away access to the time, you know, I've got, um, I mean, too many now, but I guess <laughs> five, uh, 30, roughly 30 telescopes on remote observatories. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah 20, 23 on, uh, my property here, you know, that are on, uh, rem they're remotely operated that can allow people just to log into. And, you know, if you watch the talk, I know you did Scott, but there's a 12 year old kid that logged in from 2,500 miles away right. and took this, I mean, it's the best image I have on my Instagram and it wasn't even mine. It was his and it's a 12 year old kid, you know, awesome. but I think that's what it's about is like, we need to find ways to pass the baton, you know, not to prove that it's been heavy, but instead, you know, to, to show like, this is, this is where we've gotten and that this could support with support can go even further and pass it to children to take this further than we were able to, because whether we like it or not, they're going to, they already are. And I think. Right. With just a just a few opportunities, you know, these kids can really push the boundaries of of what it is right. we love. And we don't we don't know where the next genius is going to come from, you know. And we got some. I, I remind people um, that uh, you know we have big problems to solve, and yeah. uh, humans have big problems to solve, and it will be solved with. Uh, you know, uh, concepts uh, born out of engineering and science and, uh, you know, to make sure that we all can live on to have even longer lives and healthier lives, you know. Yeah. And interesting lives, you know, that it would uh, it would be a pity for us to uh, to extend our lives and for it to somehow become mundane and boring, you know. So I, I, I think uh, like you that um, AI is going to play a huge role in this and it's going to yeah. allow us to be more time to be creative. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's it's a way to connect people. You know, I'm not I know the vast majority of these talks and, and rightfully so are about science, as you know, from I mean, even your time here visiting and things. It's just it's mm -hmm. not that's not my passion at all. It's the philosophy side of this that I really dig into and love. But I think there's so many different lenses you can view this through and every one of them is productive. I haven't found anything. Anytime somebody started talking to me about astronomy, I haven't found it to be like, oh, yeah, that was really unproductive or negative. It's generally always something that's uplifting. It's inspiring. And it's something that whether it's just a celebration of creativity or, you know, pushing the, the cutting edge of science, I think it's something that has tremendous value. And so, you know, obviously it's a mission, it's a mission worth pursuing and pushing. And, um, sure. you know, when you ask like where I think I'll be, I think that's, that's pretty, I'm pretty certain that's where I'm going to be, Scott. <laughs> I think the, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's cool. Well, Dustin, thanks for coming on um, to thanks our program me, and uh, um, give the, give the, uh, 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 you know, the TED talk a watch. I will. I will find it and put it into chat. Um, also, there was somebody say, uh, wanting to know how uh, they could get in touch with you. I recommended they go through the OPT website. Yeah, yeah, that OPT Instagram, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, uh, you know, however is easiest. My name is Dustin Gibson, but however I can help reach out, happy to help any way I can. And if you've got ideas for ways to do it better, by all means, let's just, let's do it. Let's give access to people where we can. 
And um, I saw one of my good buddies, Robert, just jumped in. Are hey, there? Hey, Robert, hey, yeah. Well, Scott, thanks for having me, man. It's always hey, good to see you. you so much, and uh, for, thanks for everything you do, and everyone else here as well. Love, love all the talks. So, thank yeah. you. I'll see you next thanks time. So much. That's great. Okay. Well, we let's uh, Carrie. Let's uh, bring on Maxi Falares. Yeah, Maxi Falares. Yeah. So I have been asking Maxi about his talk now because I, I know what he. Uh, I, I, I think alguien lo dice bien mi apellido. At last, someone says very good my last name. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my finally said it correctly, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's Falieres, like it's like Falieres. Okay. Falieres. Falieres. Right. Ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just have to listen to it a few more times and I'll I'll get it. I promise. No, no, that's no problem. It's, it's so uh, insane and so game changing that you uh, started doing this that I was telling you that I have so many friends that do like this deep sky astrophotography and that can believe that you can do it with a cell phone and actually you have it like astro modified right yes i wow <laughs> i was working uh, with a cell phone in with a huawei p10 plus that i bought very cheap because the camera doesn't work but the lens doesn't work but the sensor of the camera worked it and i remember before that that i was practicing with a samsung s4 mini to all cell phones and i also grab out the, the lens, put it on a Maxuto telescope and start to do like a planetary camera, some pictures of uh, the moon, Jupiter, and also Saturn, you know, and that's even working with a one meter and a half almost of focal length of that telescope, it's practically you have in there the planet. But, it, and also the, the size of the sensor is pretty small. Anyway, uh, I I have this, another cell phone, a new one, and I tried to do the same, uh, working on the Newtonian telescope, uh, grabbing out the lens that it doesn't work, but the sensor works. So I start to do some disk sky objects, uh, galaxies, nebulas, but, uh, uh, like I say, the, the the sensor is pretty small, so I have like I'm really soon in the field of view. Uh, so I decided to continue in doing pictures with the cell phone uh, only with the lens above um, in um, ocular. So I was doing almost a year. So I get a, I remember I get a new camera, a, an icon. And then I started to go in more kind of professional, but uh, of course I'm an amateur. Uh, I'm still practicing. I'm still working. Of what I uh, well, I think that I I found my way uh, in these uh, times that uh, I'm working right now, uh, taking pictures of um, my, in my backyard, even I have a, a light pollution in Bortle five or six, maybe seven, and, but doing with a filter, like uh, here in the background, we have the pencil nebula is from the Southern Hemisphere, and nearby in the Vela uh, constellation. And this object, it's really thin to do it without a filter that grows up the, the details of the nebula. Uh, I tried to do it uh, outside of my city uh, without a lens, only a color camera, but no, it doesn't look the same. So I, I, I did three nights taking this picture of this object. Um, but well, uh, right now I, still working on it uh, practicing like i say uh, anyway i i i'm doing a astronomy outreach of course when every uh, here in, in chivilcoy where i live or maybe alberti they ask me if i can go there to help you know to uh, show well, what i do or maybe um they do a presentation and then we start to do some um, 
views uh, with telescopes, Newtonian and everything. So uh, I can help them to share with the people that comes and make a line uh, to, to see and move the, the scope and everything because I really like that. So tonight is going to I'm going to present this uh, that that I, we were doing uh, in the uh, in a couple months. I, I, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Perfect. Great. So well, uh, like I say, uh, in February, maybe it was 15, I think. Um, in the city of Alberti, in the uh, observatory that it, where I go to do deep sky objects picture, uh, they invite me because they are going to do um, uh, some stargazing, watching the the, the form sky with both the two and three, and also watching through telescope, uh, chatting uh, and telling some stories from here and um, and well they you know they prepare all these uh, chairs and this uh well in, i don't know how to say in english a colchoneta or maybe um, I, I don't like know like a mattress a mattress yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, and you know here's the sunset uh, pointing to the west uh, you know the, uh, this this night came almost 200 people and we didn't expect that. We we expect maybe 50, maybe 70, but 200 people, it's a lot of people to, that you have to uh, be been talking. They ask you some things and, and also you have to um, um, show in uh, what you're doing with the telescope, uh, what are you watching, explain that. And the next one, the, the same and the next one the same. Of course, it doesn't get tired of me because I like to talk. I like to talk too much. Uh, if I if I could, I. Um, At two hundred people, it's way too much crowded. You were yeah. alone presenting. No, 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 no. I, in this case, we we were uh, four people, but anyway, it's too much with only. Uh, two telescopes, one binoculars, and you know, I put my, I, I went with my lens, uh, I have an ASCAT uh, 200 lens uh, to do, you know, the, 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 the idea was this, uh, the presentation was talking about maybe the comet uh, E3, and they were going to watch it through two telescopes, and then they're going to uh, be with me, then I'm going to uh, show them how it looks like taking with a picture that is live right now, you know. But no, it, it wasn't wasn't possible. I armed my equipment maybe for nothing, but I didn't care because uh, the experience to have that uh, contact with the people um, and how the children ask you things, how curious curious uh, are they. And I remember a little girl that uh, bring his little small telescope and she asked me how to uh, use it when I was using the, the another one to, to the uh, another person. But uh, I, I said to her, uh, wait me a minute, I'm, I'm still um, in explaining this, but uh, we're going to, to see what you, what you bring. So more later, uh, the, the moon rise up and she couldn't point uh, the, the, with the telescope of the moon. I, I show how to do it in the single way, for example, and how she can uh, do focus uh, with a small eyepiece anyway, but she was really impressive and that's the importance of all that. And well, here's... <laughs> Oh, I, I have the same t-shirt, I think. Here's me. <laughs> I was uh, uh, pulling my, my equipment, my little equipment, because I I was working. Uh, I finished my work uh, here in Chivicoy. I had my things in uh, uh, in my car, and I drove uh, 40 kilometers to Alberti, so I can uh, go there and prepare, and, you know, and in this 
case, you can see there are a lot of people sitting, but we expected maybe a little bit more, but it was unbelievable. Uh, here's an example. Well, th then they um, turn off these lights because uh, the, the, the sky was really clean. We didn't have smoke. We didn't have, well, we, we have some clouds to the south, but uh, the weather says it's going to the east, so they will not going to bother us. And well, we did uh, start gazing, telling stories. Uh, and you know, it, this was for all the people. And more later, I, I remember I was almost 3 a.m. Uh, I be, I've been there and uh, then I went to my home and the, another day <laughs> go to work. And well, I, this is a picture that I took when everyone goes out. Uh, this light, this is not from lights from the, the place. This is from the moon. You can see how much brighter it is because it was a, a gibious moon. Uh, and, but the, passing the full moon almost but anyway i saw the the stars so i stay with uh, well marcos santa rosa uh, that he was he's the director of this place uh, that, and he invited to me and also was the mayor of alberti uh, that they are uh, really friends but also came uh, people of the province of my government uh, of my 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 Brahmins uh, uh, to to this place without saying anything that they are going to be there of uh, like formal uh, occasion they went to uh, uh, put some tents and go sleep and do camp things so I invited to them and their family to take this selfie you know I put a table put my cell phone and you know like a lucky imaging. Uh, take a 30 second picture and of course I say nobody moves in 30 seconds please don't breathe nothing oh, breathe. And we, I, I was counting you know uh, one two three I, I, I finally the 30 and I when I say uh, I think we can move now uh, and let everybody start to laughing because you was like a stone like this and without breathing almost and now i think th this was the best picture and here uh, the yeah. uh, west is orion belt here's the m42 regal and uh, and of course the telescope it was a, a, the real uh, i didn't expect this um, um i don't have to say uh, enquadre uh, this me. frame the frame, this frame the framing yeah because I was, I, I couldn't yeah, it's see. Like perfect, right? I mean, look at that. The belt of Orion is kind of lined right up there. It's, yeah, uh, actually. Yeah. Even the telescope is the protagonist very, of this picture. Good. It's the most, uh, uh, it's like a statue, the telescope. You can see it's per perfectly detailed because it doesn't move. <laughs> it doesn't move at all. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, well, here is, is Marcos Santa Rosa. Uh, uh, he's uh, Germán Lago, the mayor of Alberti, and these people that came uh, to stay the night, uh, you know, they have a really good time. We were chatting about, of course, stars, everything, showing the moon, and they took pictures with the cell phone, and, and you know, and watching the moon with a eight inches telescope is impressive. Of course, I told them, when you watch it through the telescope, prepare to be blamed for a couple of minutes. So, uh, well, anyway, Maxi, this was, yes. Maxi, uh, hey. what objects uh, do you think that were like the most popular uh, among the kids? Well, the, the, depends of the light pollution, depends of the, well, of course, the, the, the sky and, and the time of the year. For example, now in the, the summer here, we have M42 that is the king of the, to, to try to watch it, uh, you know, uh, through a telescope. Of course, you have to measure the field of view that uh, maybe, of course, you, if you have a focal length very large, maybe you, you, will, you don't have 
all the, the detail or maybe all the, 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 the shape of the nebula, maybe the, the, the center and, and that's all. And of course you will need diameter to bring out more light and see more details. And of course, if, the, if you don't, doesn't have light pollution, you start to see some kind of colors a little bit, but anyway, it's amazing. And of course, um, I remember watching uh, with a Dobsonian eight inch telescope, uh, galaxies, like it was kind of pictured in negative, of course, but I see, I saw the, the shape of, for example, the sculpture galaxy. Um, and, the, but, but for the people you were helping to stargaze, what was the, the object, like the favorite one that they wanted to, to see besides the moon? No, that, they, they, <laughs> they, they didn't know uh, about almost anything because they went to like curious. They want to see what is going on there. Uh, of course, we told them we have the, to, to watch the, the green comet that the media says. So, yeah. oh, we want to see the, the green comet. We want to see, it. okay, of course, no problem. But you're going, you will not going to see it like that. You're going to see like in this shape with this kind of, and maybe the all the people that I showed them, it was, I don't know, 80% that they, they could see the nucleus and the coma. And then of course I show when they saw it on the telescope, I show a picture that I took uh, a couple of uh, days ago to see what they saw. Uh, and then they realize what they saw and give it like a shape, you know, because they don't know how to watch it really deep sky objects to the telescope. So maybe if you have images to show them later, they will bring some kind of shape and, they, and give form well, of what they saw. Uh, but and did it happen in Argentina that the in the news and all the media they were talking about this the green comet in here it yeah. was like that so everybody were asking me like oh, what about the green comet hey, there are like many comets that are green <laughs> so what can I say but the media is like wow the green comet the green comet and exactly. when they try to see it they say oh it's not that green oh uh, it's, that, it's not that it's huge that... <laughs> yes uh, you know. I was taking pictures with the lens and I remember watch a real field of view and the small comet. But when I put it with the, with the telescope, uh, this is the, I, I processed again this uh, two days ago, no, four days ago. And this is in Alberti, for example. And you can see the nucleus there and the stars, but they only see this and maybe a little one, two, three stars, and that's all. And of course, the moon was rising, so the 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 contrast of the background uh, it kills you the, the, the to watch that. So uh, I, I I don't know if I answered your question, Kari. No, no, no. It, it's about that, like um, how media and how the news. Uh, talk about uh, astronomical events and they offer it like a marketing thing like uh, the green comet in here was like that so everybody were like I need to see the green comet like there were no other green comets or there were all no other comets it was like uh, the news like all the week you see it and what about the green comet uh, and it was like okay okay no. No. I, I remember that the neo wise the they were we, we couldn't see here in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, and, no, in here was neither. Because, uh, the, but there, were some, that, there were some fake astro photographies that appear like around there and they say, hey, I got it like with a single image with all the detail and, yeah. the, and, and all the other stars were like very punctual. And you think, oh no, no this smells fake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I remember uh, the media uh, was saying, oh, maybe we can see it. There are some media that say, no, maybe we'll see it or maybe we'll not. We have to be see it in the past days. But the another one said, no, we can see it because in the another say, saw it and we're going to see it and everything. I didn't see everything. I remember went to the farm 
and what it what it, what it is now that, that's it now okay but then we have the leonard comet uh, at the at the finals of uh, 2021 in december that when it appears in the southern hemisphere is going to it was going to to show more uh, light and details and tail you know and and i i could i could see it uh, even in my backyard and even, of course, with a telescope, but uh, in the afternoon when the sun goes down, but we have this uh, clarity even, I could I could see it. Uh, so in this case, they didn't even um, put it on the media to say, oh, we have a comet. But I think, uh, why is that? Uh, because, of course, in the northern hemisphere, they start to do the news and say we can see this so when we receive the news from the northern they want to do the same but uh, like in this case in the leonard in the northern hemisphere it wasn't pretty much brighter like it, like it was it, it was here so in that case they didn't give uh, well, I don't want to say anything bad. No, right? <laughs> that always uh, happened to us here in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what the people that knows about this stuff, they say, okay, we're going to see the Leonard. We we do some publishing, but for the ninety nine percent of the population, they even care about that. They don't know about that, but when they see it on the media, oh look at uh, and i think that's why well continuing with the what, what we, i was doing and helping uh, in this case in the parque cielos del sur this is a, a, a park where you can go there with your children and play with stuff uh, play uh, games with in the, like every park in every place in the world but this park particularly is a relationship with astronomy uh, because it's uh, basically oriented to the north, east, west, and south uh, poles. Uh, they have lunar games. They have uh, positional and equatorial games that, that you can bring, but or you can do, for example. But when you go there, there are many people that don't know that. So they build this like a map. You can see, uh, oh, wow. for example, here's the entrance. You enter from here in now in the number one. And you can see a lot of QR codes. So you can scan it. And this go, uh, leads you to a page there. They have videos to explain about that game, you know? Uh, and here's the, the central part of the park. Here's the, the entrance of the uh, place of multiple uses, like they say Zoom, uh, Salon de Usos Multiples. But also you can go there to this balcony, like a caracol stair, but uh, it's a ramp uh, to all. Everyone goes there, but uh, in all these places, you have uh, all kind of games. And of course, you have the references here for each other. But of course, this is in Spanish. And, and they asked me if I want to give you a little or, or give you a picture to put it, of course. And I remember a picture that I took of the Gabriela Mistral Nebula. Uh, you know, Kerry, well, I think he went, um, is the, a, a poetry from Chile. And, and the, the, the people that build this, uh, well, this uh, um, plane, they put a, a reference of, of, of a poetry of, that she wrote and put a picture that I did uh, here in my backyard in Chivilcoy. So I'm really grateful for that because it's like a little recognition and I can say 
I'm being part of this a little bit, a little bit, you know. But anyway, uh, I'm glad to to be part and help to and share my my picture to another ones. So what uh, the purpose of of that day was two things. One, to present the videos to the people that went there, scan and see what uh, is going on. But also the the well, of course, the two events were great. But the and that day we had a, a Jupiter occultation, yes, a Jupiter occultation by the moon. So, uh, well, in this case, uh, it came a lot of people. I'm glad for that. Well, here's a friend of mine, Santiago Viso, that he brings his telescope and he was, of course, helping to to show and and to to watch the, the event. And I bring my full equipment equipment to because in this case, um, you know, I, I I thought there were going to be a lot of people, but the event is pretty short to watch it when the Jupiter uh, occurs. Uh, by the moon. So I say to Armando Sandanel, the director, well, he's no longer the director of the park, but uh, I say, I told to him, uh, I can uh, share my screen for watching in video live, so you can put it on a projector and everyone can watch the event actually happening in the, that moment. So, well, uh, we could do that. Uh, well, you can see uh, it's a lot of people that came. Well, here's my equipment, I, my computer, and I was connecting to this computer here and, and projecting to the, to the place. And you can see I'm pointing to this place. In this case, this is the moon. And I remember it was like a smoke or clouds. And, the, and then of that, the moon goes out. But anyway, I, I was still pointing. So in a moment, I remember to the, the, the moon show up almost right there between the cables, between the lights and everything. And then I could capture the moment that Jupiter uh, comes again uh, to, to see it. So this is a, a picture that I, that I could make of the moment that uh, starting the the occultation, you can see the the crescent moon shape a, a, a month ago, but also here <laughs> you can see Jupiter and the the border of the moon, you know. And when you complete all that, you see all the circum circumference of the of the moon. And then this is not a very good picture because it was almost. I remember it was five degrees above the horizon between clouds, between everything that you want to think. But anyway, I could capture the moment that Jupiter starts to come out again. So uh, this is, was a really good night. Uh, well, I, I remember that a lot of people went there. They, they have a good time. The weather was okay, even that. And then we did, a, a, of course, obser observations and everything. But, uh, well, that, I think that's that's all for tonight, maybe. No, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. No, but continue. More later, I'm going to, to share what I'm doing right now. <laughs> because I, I'm taking pictures uh, to a place of course, that David uh, Iker uh, named a couple minutes ago. And I see Molly right now here. And she will like what I'm uh, taking pictures right now. So uh, let's have a uh, finish for that for now. Maybe more later, I will come back. Thanks, Maxi. And I, that's so cool to to. Thank um, you. Thank you to, to you, Kerry, and congratulations for the apple. And thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. And you're a good communicator. That's that's great. 
we we have to improve our skills in English, Maxi. We have to keep practicing. <laughs> if we, we don't do it, we're never going to. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so um, let's. Uh, uh, we've got more to come here, so let's let's move along. We have. Uh, um, yeah, we have now Robert Reeves. Robert Reeves, right? And so Robert Reeves mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, he's been so kind to to come on to Global Star Party. And he started, uh, uh, you and I didn't have a lot of time to talk about this uh, ahead of time, uh, Carrie. But uh, uh, Robert uh, is actually known all over the world for his lunar uh imaging and stuff, but he has a deep history in astrophotography, and uh, he is um, he's one of the movers and shakers of the Texas Star Party. Uh, he is a Celestron ambassador. Uh, he's an Explorer Alliance ambassador as well, and um, so he, he came to me with this idea of doing something called Postcards from the Moon, and uh, you're going to learn something tonight. He is... Uh, he, he is uh, really going to take a deep dive into what the moon is all about. Well, uh, thank you very much for, oh, first, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. It's always a grand experiment to see if I've successfully connected to Zoom. Um, but uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to come on and chat about the moon. It's, uh, um, well, as Scott says, it's kind of my specialty, although I, I'm spread um, equally in other parts of astrophotography, I am more well known for my lunar work and uh, I enjoy popularizing the moon. It uh, kind of lost favor with the astronomy community when deep sky became a more um, oh, available target uh, back in the 1970s when, uh, well, the company that I work for, Celestron, came out with the uh, Celestron 8 telescope, very portable telescope, where people could travel out into dark sky and enjoy deep uh, uh, deep sky. They didn't have to lug these cumbersome Newtonian uh, equatorial telescopes that were uh, typical of the day. And uh, uh, deep sky became very popular and people kind of forgot about the moon. Uh, NASA went to the moon, conquered the moon, uh, men walked on the moon, and then uh, for political reasons, we stopped going to the moon and uh, the moon fell out of favor from the amateur community. But uh, the, the moon is very much a very dynamic, uh, very available target. Uh, you don't need the uh, dark sky. Uh, the moon laughs at light pollution. Uh, you can observe the moon anytime it's in the sky. So uh, it's, it's a very viable target and the geology on it is amazing. It's the only world that we can uh, see in an amateur telescope and resolve kilometer resolution on another planet. And we can do this from our own backyard. So uh, last week I spoke a little bit about the creation of the moon, uh, how the moon's face came into being. And we discussed a little bit about how the moon was named over the ages, how uh, various naming systems came and went out of favor and how we now uh, have adopted the series of uh, uh, the naming scheme for naming the moon. But today I wanna to talk about craters. Um, I realized when I put my slides together that I did not have something explaining the origin or the creation of the craters uh, but um, we'll talk about their geology anyway. Uh, but basically, uh, don't get the idea that craters on the moon are like bullet holes, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, shooting a, a gun at a wall and bang, it makes a, a little hole in the wall. No, craters on the moon are created by a different process. Uh, the asteroids, the comets that impact the moon are traveling at what we call cosmic velocities, uh, speeds in excess of the escape velocity of the Earth. Uh, this can be uh, anywhere from seven to 20 kilometers per second, uh, uh, these impact speeds. And at that velocity, uh, the impactor doesn't just punch a hole in the moon. What happens is it slams into the moon at such high velocity that the uh, kinetic energy is instantly turned into heat. The kinetic energy of the impact is instantly turned into heat and it vaporizes the impactor with such force that the vaporization acts like a bomb. So the uh, incoming 
asteroid or comet could come at any angle, straight down at an angle, at a slant. And once it impacts and explodes, it will create a round crater because it's the explosion of the vaporization of the impactor that creates the crater. Uh, if it were just a simple bullet hole type thing, a majority of the craters on the moon would be elongated from, from a physical impact. But it's not the physical impact that creates the crater. It's the explosion of the vaporization of the impactor that creates the crater. Therefore, we end up with a majority of craters appearing round. And now another grand experiment. We'll try to share screen and uh, see if I can make things work. And grand. Okay, are we seeing a picture of the full moon? Uh, seeing thumbnails right now. Oh, great. Okay, here's here's. You should just uh, share your whole screen instead of the folder so that I, um, we can I am, it. I'm trying to do that. I need to okay. stop and reshare. Yeah, sometimes you have okay, to stop, uh, stop sharing. Yeah, and you do, and, and you do uh, a full screen view. Now, how do I get back to where I was without leaving? Hmm. Hit the uh, share screen button on the bottom of the dialog, you know. Okay, I'm screen there. Button. And then hit um, like screen one instead of the folder. Say screen one or desktop or a screen two or something like that. That's for Scott. Oh, so that's the folder. Um, we won't You're be able to see in the folder. Yeah, because you, you selected the folder, I think, instead of uh, full screen. Oh, okay. I... On the on the list of um, where it shows, uh, yeah, go. that works. Perfect. Got it. Okay. Yeah, well, perfect. like I said, I'm I'm very much a Zoom rookie. Uh, uh, every every <laughs> time I try to do covered. this screen share, it just goes to worms on me. Anyway, so we're talking about types of craters on the moon. Uh, we look up at the moon, and the you know the average person sees yeah a lot of bumps and holes in the in, uh, on the moon uh, yeah they have like potholes in the road out in front. Uh, see one crater, you've seen them all. But the um, farthest thing from the truth, each one has its own individual personality. Uh, craters on the moon. Okay, now why is it my? There we go. Craters on the moon. Um, follow a geologic sequence. You know, uh, we're, we're used to stars being uh, classified by a main sequence where we've got uh, uh, stars going from, from red to blue uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, main sequence of stars, how we categorize it. The well, same thing with the craters on the moon. There is a main sequence, uh, not quite as many categories, just three, but uh, any crater that is smaller than about 16 to 21 kilometers in diameter is just a simple bowl-shaped crater. The dynamics of the impact will only uh, create the, the this dish-shaped uh, depression in the moon. Uh, a crater larger than 16 to 21 kilometers, um, the dynamics of the impact, the rebound of the explosion, uh, uplifts the center or, or, or the, the uh, bedrock underneath the, the crater explosion, and it forms a central peak. And then when the uh, crater is finished being com uh, uh, composed, uh, typically the uh, physical strength of the lunar soil and bedrock is not enough to sustain, sustain the shape. So the crater collapses. The walls tumble down into a series of terraces. Uh, and then if we have a crater that is larger than 300 kilometers, well, we don't call it a crater at all. It, then it becomes a basin. And we talked about basins last week when we were talking about the, the creation of the uh, Maria on the moon. Uh, the Maria all lie within basins, um, large craters greater than 300 kilometers in diameter. So uh, some typical examples, simple craters like Helicon and Leverrier up on the uh, um, Mari Imbrium near the opening of uh, uh, the Horseshoe Bay of Sinus Aridum um, look very much like you took a giant ice cream scoop and just scooped out a chunk on the moon. Um, complex craters, Copernicus being a very typical one. Um, like I said, the uh, impact rebound in the bedrock raises up a uh, central peak and the walls 
of the crater collapse and tumble down into the into the interior of the crater in a series, uh, creating a series of terrace um, steps. And then, of course, we have a crater larger than 300 kilometers, Bailey being an, uh, an example. Uh, it's called a, a basin. Now, uh, Bailey was initially categorized as a crater before we understood the nature of basins. Uh, the concept of uh, basins on the moon really wasn't firmly established until the space age. So uh, all these old craters named back in uh, the 1600s, uh, some of them we uh, keep the legacy and uh, still call it a crater, but Bailey is indeed a basin. It's uh, about three kilometers larger than the minimum size for a basin. So moving on, uh, some complex crater examples, again, featuring the central peak and the collapsed terraced walls. Uh, Pythagoras up in the Northeast, uh, Geminus just above Maricrisium over on the uh, east side of the moon, and Moretus down near the South Pole. Um, all a very similar geologic form. The uh, pronounced central peak, the There's collapsed sorry, terraced walls. Give a talk here. So, uh, so I may have to give a talk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Seth, we can so hear I'm you. I'm just going to stay here. I'll give you a call as soon as I'm done. Okay. Okay. Thanks for bye for bye for first. <laughs> uh, Seth, you need the mute when you're on the phone. <laughs> okay, moving on here. Um, one thing we notice about uh, some craters on the moon, uh, they uh, are surrounded by this bright ray pattern. And uh, what this is, is an indication that the crater is fairly young on a lunar geologic uh, scale, um, generally less than a billion years old. Uh, crater rays are composed of pulverized glassy material thrown out of the crater by the explosion that created it. And over a period of about a billion years, the uh, constant tilling and gardening of the uh, lunar regolith by micrometeorite impacts and the effect of uh, uh, solar radiation and solar flares uh, will eventually erase a cra uh, crater rays. So if crater doesn't have rays, it's automatically probably over a billion years old. If it has crater rays, it is a youngster, uh, a billion years or younger. Now, um, the uh, material that make up rays, uh, like I say, glassy material. It's very similar to the material that uh, they use on the uh, interstate highway signs that make it very reflective to your headlights. Uh, you can generally read a highway sign on, on an interstate at a much greater distance than what your headlights are normally illuminating the, the sign. You see the, uh, the writing on the sign long before you can even recognize the sign in your headlights. So uh, this glassy material um, is very good at reflecting light directly back toward its source. Uh, on the highway, it's your car headlights and therefore you get to see the sign very well. Uh, if uh, in the case of crater rays on the moon, it is reflecting light back toward its source, the sun. So uh, during the full moon, rays are brightest near the full moon because the earth is lined up between the moon and the sun. And we see this uh, reflected sunlight from the ray material coming back toward us. And uh, Tycho has the largest ray system on the moon, uh, spanning about 2,200 kilometers across the uh, Southern Highlands. And uh, Tycho was formed, we think, about 107, 108 million years ago. Uh, it's one of the true youngsters on the moon. And uh, there is a mystery. Uh, notice the uh, parallel rays extending up toward the northwest. Um, they don't seem to come to a common focus at the middle of Tycho, where you expect normal um, um, rays to radiate out from the middle of the impact. Uh, they're parallel rays that seem to be almost tangential to the uh, crater rim. So a little curiosity about what's going on there, what, what, what created these parallel rays. And another uh, type of ray is a uh, monodirectional or a butterfly ray. 
uh, when we see monodirectional rays, such as those extending from Messier and Messier A, um, uh, uh, or the butterfly pattern extending from Proclus on the, on the right, um, this is an indication of a very oblique impact, extremely shallow angle. Now notice the, uh, the uh, uh, shallow impact still created the round crater, but the ray pattern is different. I had a very, very low inclination impact. No ray material splashes back in the director, uh, direction that the impactor arrived from. So we end up with these butterfly ray patterns splattered off to the side instead of a, a, a fan of rays completely surrounding the, uh, the crater. Now, another class of craters here are called secondaries. Now these are created by the impact of ejecta thrown by the explosive formation of the parent crater. Now, uh, secondary craters are shallow because the impact speed of a secondary, the, the projectile that created a secondary cannot be higher than the 2.4 kilometer escape velocity of the moon. Otherwise the projectile blown out of the primary crater would go into solar orbit and never fall back down. So uh, if it's got a, uh, uh, um, ejection velocity of under 2.4 kilometers is going to come back down, is going to make a hole. Um, now, secondary craters often lay in linear chains, and we can see this very evident in the uh, northern regions uh, above Copernicus. Uh, let's see um, ropey like chains or uh, linear chains that uh, taper off in a bird's foot pattern, with a bird's foot uh, pattern uh, facing away from the direction the impactors came from. Um, we think a majority of the craters on the moon that are under 20 kilometers in diameter may be secondaries from larger impacts, but uh, secondary craters can appear hundreds of kilometers from the primary impact. So associating a particular 20 kilometer diameter crater with a specific parent crater hundreds of kilometers away, it's, it's, it's a tough sled. So uh, we uh, really have no way to pin those down. Now, not all craters are round. There are elongated craters on the moon, but for different reasons, like uh, Hainzel uh, in the upper left, a peanut-shaped crater. Uh, this is actually over several overlapping circular craters. And the same with Ray to E, the uh, keyhole-shaped crater, uh, overlapping successive impacts. But Schiller, out of the southwestern portion of the moon, is a single oblique impact. That must have been spectacular when that happened. Uh, Schiller is almost 170 kilometers long. If this were translated, uh, this length were translated into the diameter of a round crater, Schiller would be among the top 10 largest craters on the moon. So it's a, a very unique and a very unusual object. Um, other craters that aren't round, we've got Anna Zibander up in the north, uh, kind of a valentine shape, uh, heart shaped um, apparition. Um, again, two over, two overlaying craters. Uh, the same with Meton, uh, a four leaf clover. I call it the, my lunar good luck charm. And uh, again, the overlapping, uh, um, four overlapping craters where uh, basin ejecta buried the interior of the craters and buried the, their, their overlapping rims. So now we only see a, a four leaf clover shape. Uh, Agrippa and Godin near the middle of the moon. Uh, Agrippa on top, uh, bell-shaped, uh, excuse me, bullet-shaped. And uh, Godin on the bottom, uh, very distinctly bell-shaped. Looked like the clapper hanging out the bottom of the bell uh, uh, at the uh, southern end of it. Uh, four fractured craters. Uh, these started out as typical um, complex craters, a central peak, collapsed terrace walls, but the four fracture craters typically reside near the rims of Maria, and the impact that created these craters shattered the crust underneath the, the crater and allowed um, uh, subterranean magma chambers, the same magma chambers that fed the lava eruptions that created the Maria also flow up through the fractures in the bottom of the crater and fill the crater with, with basalt from below. 
the lava does not spill over the edge of the crater and enter it, but it comes up from underneath. And as this uh, volcanic uplift pushes the floor of the crater up, uh, we end up with these uh, rather unique um, fracture patterns within the crater. Uh, Gassendi being a very prominent one, Posidonius up on Mars Serenitatis, uh, um, Atlas Crater uh, up on the northeast side of the moon, all have these uh, very pronounced real patterns, crack uh, patterns within them. Uh, ghost craters. And these are craters that existed on the bottom uh, or within a basin prior to the lava flooding that created the maria within the basin. And as the lava flooding filled the basin, it covered over pre-existing craters. So uh, uh, we, we end up with some of them that survive only by the very crown of the rim protruding through the basalt cover. Uh, Lamont over near the Apollo 11 landing site on Mars Serenitatis, uh, it is completely covered, but uh, shallow enough that wrinkle ridges in the uh, and the lava flow uh, are frozen in place and show us the form, the original form of Lamont buried under the Serenitatis lavas. Uh, Stadius crater up near uh, Copernicus, it's actually laying in the Copernican, uh, or should I say the Copernican secondary crater field is laying on top of it, uh, but we still see the circular rim of Stadius protruding. Uh, the same with Flamsteed P, uh, uh, 60, uh, almost a 100 kilometer diameter crater uh, buried by Procellarum basalts. And now all we see are the, the crowns of the crater rim protruding through the basalt. Um, Catena is a scientific name for a crater chain. Now, uh, is David Levy still there or is he exited? He is uh, probably a very well-known example of uh, some of his work, very well-known example of how a catena is created on the moon. Because remember back in the 1990s, Shoemaker-Levy 9 whacked into Jupiter and we could see it bombing down on Jupiter one, one chunk at a time, boom, boom, boom. Right. Well, imagine the same thing happening on the moon. A, uh, uh, comet or an asteroid, rubble pile asteroid, gets broken up by Earth's gravity, the moon's gravity, and doesn't hit in one solid chunk, but it has instead uh, rains down like a string of pearls or, or a stick of bombs dropped by a, a World War II bomber and creates this linear chain of craters. So uh, uh, there are, there's a number of those, Catena Abulfeda, uh, Catena Davy, Catena Muller, uh, all of these very easily seen in a, uh, in a backyard telescope. So we're gonna wrap this thing up by uh, uh, looking at uh, the variations of craters along one line of longitude on the moon, 60 degrees east, which is right at the, uh, the waxing, or excuse me, the waning gibbous moon uh, along the Terminator where, where sunset is. So we're gonna, march down the Terminator and see the, the marvelous variations of craters that we see at very low sun elevations, accentuates the elevation of the features, makes the relief appear where we could easily see the features of these. Uh, De La Rue crater right in the center, 136 kilometers in diameter. Uh, Pre-Nectarian means it's one of the oldest craters on the moon. Uh, it uh, uh, was in place before the great impacts that created the basins that later became uh, the uh, the uh, filled with lava and became the Maria. Uh, a little bit further south, uh, Indimion, uh, 126 kilometers in diameter, larger than Plato, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a Plato wannabe because it filled up with basalt, completely smoothed over the interior, much like Plato, looks like a giant parking lot, no signs of the original uh, floor or the central peak. So been completely covered over with basalt fill. Uh, further down, Masala. And I'm going to say that if you hear the name Masala, and the first thing that comes to mind is the classic 1959 movie, Ben-Hur. Well, you're my age. The youngsters probably don't know what I'm talking about, but the uh, Masala uh, was uh, Ben-Hur's nemesis in the, in the movie, Ben-Hur, Judah Ben-Hur's uh, lifelong nemesis. Uh, 
but if uh, you're not my age, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. So we'll move on. Uh, Geminus, uh, a little bit younger, Eratosthenian epoch means it could be up to about 3 billion years old. But uh, here we're looking at a more classic, less ruined crater. We've got you know, the classic form of uh, central peak, collapsed terrace walls. Uh, Cleomedes, just uh, above uh, Maria. Um, Chrysium on the east east limb of the moon. Uh, Nectarian, almost 4 billion years old, uh, partially filled with basalt. We see a little bit of a real structure and it is a floor fractured crater as well. Uh, Langrinus, uh, another Eratosthenian, uh, very classic structure of collapsed terrace walls and central peak, very prominent central peak. Uh, Vindelinus, further south, pre-Nectarian, very old, probably over more than four billion, four billion years old. Wow. Batavius, uh, Imbrian, could be almost four billion years old. Uh, but the cute thing about um, Batavius is that radial rill protruding outward. Uh, westward from the central peak out to the rim, and then yet another rill that is slicing through the western um, wall of the crater. No, no features like this. Uh, this is unique. Uh, such a precise linear rill within a crater. It says uh, Patavius is the only one that shows an example of this. And uh, finally, uh, Snellius, Davinus, Frenerius. Uh, uh, the older ones, more degraded ones, obviously very old, Nectarian, uh, 3.8 to 3.9 billion years old. And then uh, Stevinus in between them, uh, Copernican epoch, less than a billion years old, newcomer, the, the new kid on the block. So uh, just about anywhere you look on the moon, you're going to see such a variation of craters. So none of them are the same. They're not just boring bumps and holes in the moon. They each have a story to tell. Uh, their form informs us about their history and geology, uh, their age. Uh, once you understand how to read a crater, uh, look at its form, uh, you can take a pretty good guess as to how old it is. So uh, it, it's it's a, a, a fun thing to do. Um, understanding um, who's new on the block, what's been there for ages, what overlaps what. Um, if it's a crater is on top of another one, it's obviously younger. Um, if it's heavily, heavily degraded, uh, it's, it's probably nectarian, pre-nectarian. So uh, understanding uh, the geology of it uh, lets you understand the very nature of the face of the moon. They're just not all the same thing. They're very, very unique each very different, each with its own story to tell. And I hope the next time you look at the moon, you, you kind of recognize some of these features and uh, begin to make friends with these things because each one has an individual personality like a different person in the room. So uh, I think that is my final, yep, that is definitely my final slide. So uh, that's about all I have to say about craters tonight because uh, I, I think I started late and I'm ending late, so uh, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Well, Robert, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. We'll talk about another aspect of the moon next week. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to it. All righty. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we are going to take a 10-minute break, and we're going to come back um, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Seth Shostak from SETI. Um, I'm really excited about this. Seth uh, always gives a fantastic talk. So back in just a few minutes, grab a sandwich or a cup of coffee or what have you, and we'll be right back with you. Got the moon up in my Edge HD to show off a little bit before I start my talk after this one okay so we take a look at the you want to see it a bit. you want to show it now yeah all right let's do it let's see i better do that one and then pop that up there there we 
you go. Nice. So this is on my uh, Celestron Edge HD nine and a quarter. And yeah, I was going to use my camera lens to see the moon and Mars together because uh, they're kind of close, but I have the wrong filter in to do it. And changing the filter in there is non-trivial. So, <laughs> um, oh, well, but you can at least look at the moon up close. I might go over to Mars here momentarily. Great. Uh, People have really been looking at that, uh, the lineup of the planets recently. <laughs> so I love it when the general public gets excited about uh, astronomy and they go out and make a point of uh, observing the sky. Yeah. Molly, you have a really good scene right now, I think. I sure do. I should take some videos while I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. you can zoom in and then do a, a mosaic. Yeah, let me find let me find a nice spot here. Let's see. While you're looking for that. Oh, it looks nice. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Seth Shostak, he is uh, the senior astronomer at SETI, at the SETI Institute. That would be the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Seth, uh, Seth's talks often have to do with uh, life, the search for life uh, elsewhere in the universe. And um, uh, he is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's fabulous he's coming on here. Uh, he has, uh, um, it says here in his bio that, uh, uh, or what's written about him on Wikipedia that, uh, you know, he's hosted several um, uh, podcasts and radio shows and has played himself numerous times in television and internet film dramas. I love that. Um, he's acted in several science fiction films as well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, to get to know Seth, you will find out he is one of the most friendly uh, uh, astronomers around, and um, we're going to learn something tonight from him. So it's going to be great. Awesome. You know, for me, it's a pleasure to be with Seth because, uh, like David Levy, I saw saw him in a lot of documentaries on TV when I was a child about yeah. the universe and the, and about the, the life out there, and being with him right now with here now i can believe it so my pleasure so. that's that's what our community is all about though you know so it's really it's that this is what makes the astronomy community the greatest community on on earth <laughs> i think beatrice hines from belgium uh says i've seen seth shostak several times on television and in documentaries about astronomy By the way, Scott, can I ask you this? Uh, <laughs> how how long should I maunder on? I I was told four and a half hours, but what's the four and a half hours? Yeah, <laughs> try to keep it down to um, you know, if you could do four hours and fifteen minutes, that'd be all right, I guess. Cut it short. No, I, short, actually, actually uh, how long are the presentations <laughs> typically? I guess we're just taking a five minute break here, uh, but I do have there is a little feature. Um, that uh, we'll we'll show here of uh, I think it's a Hubble feature, which is kind of cool. Well, if you're part of the All Nighters Club, <clears throat> staying up four and a half hours wouldn't hurt, you know. To daylight. This image is one of the most iconic of all Hubble images, called Mystic Mountain, and uh, it is a place of enormous the active star formation. This entire pillar is about three light years in duration. That means it's so long that it takes light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. It takes it three years to go from bottom to top. And the entire area is filled with this really condensed uh, collection of dust and gas that's created this stellar nursery. We see on the outside edge here, where the material is, is heated and evaporating off the surface uh, of the cloud, 
but you also have stellar winds that are sculpting this, like a, like a Michelangelo that would be sculpting a statue, knocking pieces of the nebula uh, off into interstellar space. So you have a mechanical sculpting process along with a heating process from the radiation coming off of the stars. So the two together are what uh, combine to create this gloriously detailed image. You see these jets coming out of two sides of that top pillar and down here again those are signatures of stars actually forming material is coming down collapsing onto the star it getting heated up and when it tries to get out it has to, to shoot out in jets this bow shape that is actually a shock wave from the material in the jet hitting the interstellar medium and heating it up. Uh, one, of, one of the best images I think that we've, we've gotten, but this one is just the right angle that you get a gorgeous view of it. It's, it's become an iconic image, I think, for several reasons. Uh, one is that it has such incredible detail in there, but also because it holds a fascination as being a place where we can actually see stellar systems forming before our eyes. It's also famous, I think, because of its sheer beauty. I mean, there's a lot of art in, in Hubble images. A, a large fraction of the value of Hubble is not just to give us the science uh, data that we need, but it's to appreciate the beauty of the universe. Well, thanks for hanging in there with us for our uh, short break here. And thank you to Molly for showing us live images uh, of the moon. Um, our next speaker is none other than Dr. Seth Shostak. Um, I have seen him give uh, several talks. Uh, and, uh, you know, Seth moves uh, with the, uh, you know, the elite of, uh, of astronomy uh, presenters and um, uh, astronomy exploration. But uh, he also mingles with us amateurs and uh, it's, it's wonderful that uh, he's come here to Global Star Party to give a presentation about uh, the search for life in the universe. And I, I just personally love uh, hearing Seth uh, with his presentation. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely uh, what you would call a fanboy, Seth. But uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again for, for uh, blessing us with your... Uh, presence. So, I'm That's gushing here. God. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say this is the kind of introduction nobody actually wants because you know now the audience has high expectations. If That's you right. Said, you you should have said you know he's actually kind of boring, uninteresting, and usually wrong. That would have been better for the audience. Listen, this I've been trying to get get attention your attention, Scott. How long should I maunder on? I've got uh, 400 Three, pages four of hours. notes here, but I I can stay here all. <laughs> It's all yours, Seth. Thank you, ma'am. Thank Is you. Is there no answer to that question? No answer. Well, let's see. Everybody's just saying hello and, and thank you for joining us. So I think you originally had them scheduled for about 15 minutes, but uh, right. you have to go ahead and time. It's okay. <laughs> thank I'll you, Molly. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> all right, 15 minutes. Uh, I was going to read, I have a, uh, a sheet of paper here with pi out to 427 decimal places. So maybe I'll just read that. Or maybe I'll <laughs> tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, what's what's happening in the field of SETI. I think you all know that SETI is not a misspelling of my name, although it is, but, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So it's not just about finding life in space. It's finding life that's, you know, at least as intelligent as your younger brother. Uh, in my case, that wouldn't be so hard. Microbes on Mars might be able to do that. In any case, how do we do that? And what's the latest on that? Well, the way we do it is the way it's been done for a long time now, ever since 1960, actually, when Frank Drake, who was you know, a young astronomer, just recently minted from Harvard's uh, grad school, took a job at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, where they had, well, they had a an antenna, which today is probably the smallest one there. It's an 85 foot uh, diameter uh, radio antenna. And he was told by the, the director of the observatory, uh, Otto Struve, he was said, look, Frank, you're the new kid on the block. We got this antenna. We just bought it as a kit, which is true. 
um, think of something to do with it so it isn't just cluttering up the landscape. And uh, he decided to do something that was rather daring. He decided he would look for aliens, right? So he pointed the telescope over the course of two weeks. It's a couple of nearby star systems, Epsilon, Aridne, and Tau Ceti were the names of the stars. But, mm -hmm. you know, these are stars that are about 11 or 12 light years away, so pretty close. And uh, he just uh, monitored them for, uh, you know, for hours, actually, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us that somebody there had a top 40 station and was on the air. Now, uh, it's conventional to say that, well, unfortunately, Frank didn't hear anything, but that's not true. He actually did hear something, but uh, what he heard was not uh, aliens. It was apparently the U.S. military, which had a plane in the vicinity with radar on it. So the U.S. military did not count as uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, or for that matter, probably not even domestic intelligence. But the whole idea of doing this was very well received by the public. So before he knew it, Frank was in this SETI business. Now, uh, you, many of you will know this story already. There have been lots and lots of uh, efforts to try and find the aliens using this eavesdropping technique. Whenever I was on a radio telescope, I used to study galaxies that way, actually. Uh, that's another story for another time. But in any case, you know, there were, there were times, hours in every, uh, 24 hours every day, there were a couple hours where there weren't very many galaxies to be seen. So uh, I would, I still had the telescope, and I would just look up the coordinates of some nearby star systems, point the antennas in those directions with the hope that I would pick something up and be remembered long after I shuffle off this uh, mortal winding. So uh, I, I didn't hear the aliens. Nobody ever has, actually. So the idea that there are aliens out there, that's very popular, particularly with Hollywood, but we still don't have any proof of any life beyond Earth, not even microbes on Mars. I mean, presumably they're to be found in our own solar system, but we haven't done that yet. So what about the aliens? Well, do we still do the old experiment? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, so, you know, what's being done these days are various experiments where people will, you know, get some telescope time and and, and try and uh, second guess the aliens about where they're located on the sky and what frequencies they're transmitting at and what the power levels might be and polarization and, and a whole bunch of parameters, which you have to guess because, lamentably, the aliens never sent us an email with all that information on it so that we could optimize our searches. Now, uh, um, among those searches being conducted as we speak, or at least as I speak, uh, is one at the very large array, the VLA, down in northern New Mexico. And uh, this is a pretty clever experiment in which some of the incoming signal, right, well, signal, incoming cosmic static, whatever, is tapped off from each of the 27 antennas of the very large array and sent to some electronics that looks for narrow band signals in that cosmic static. In other words, this is sort of a piggyback project. Uh, they it, it has a more common, less common name, but it's, it's called commensal observing. But who knows what commensal observing really means? All it means is that it's piggybacking on conventional astronomical research to try and find the aliens. Okay. Now, a question I get a lot, other than, you know, who invited you here, a uh, question I get a lot is, well, what would typify an extraterrestrial signal? How would you know? And you know, for the lay public, they figure, oh, well, you're looking for the value of pi or, or some other unknown quantity here on Earth that the aliens are sending our way for our betterment. Uh, that would be kind of disappointing. <laughs> you know, you finally find the aliens and they tell you something that you learned about in fifth grade. But, I mean, that's one way to do it. But actually, the experiments couldn't even find that because they're not really set up to catch the message. That requires uh, high time resolution. Right, so we don't know whether we what they would be saying. What you're trying to do is just find some frequency on the radio dial where there's an excess of energy. In other words, it's a signal. And if you find that, you know, you can probably uh, buff your nails and relax for the rest of your life because you will be forever remembered as the person who found the first evidence that we have some cosmic company out there. Okay, so these experiments in some sense are very simple. You just point the antenna in a direction that you think is a promising one, like, you know, in the direction of the nearest 50 or 100 or 500 
star systems, star systems presumably that at least have a star that could have habitable planets around it. So not an O-type star, but, you know, a G-type star, or maybe an A-type star, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's what's normally done. However, you could say, well, wait a minute. We don't know where the aliens are hanging out, so why are you limiting yourself to star systems that are very conventional? And the answer to that is, well, you don't have to. You could just survey the whole sky, and that way you won't be missing out simply because you're pointing in the wrong wrong direction. But the trouble with that is it means that at any given position on the sky, you know, you're not making a very long exposure, to use a term from amateur astro astrophotography. So it's a very short exposure, so you have very little sensitivity. So it's much better to point, we think, much better to point in the direction of known nearby star systems, maybe around G-type stars, uh, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so what's happening now? Well, to begin with, as I started to mention here, the very large array in northern New Mexico is being used. And the way it's being used is that you simply tap off from the receivers for each of the 27 telescopes there, the 27 antennas, uh, tap off a little copy of the signal and put that through special receivers. That's that's a great thing to do. The other kind of thing that's being looked for these days is uh, what's called, well, there's the discipline is called optical SETI. <laughs> I don't know if you should say that in polite company because I'm not sure that it's something anybody would want to hear about, but optical SETI means you're just looking for flashing alien lasers coming off somebody's planet in another star system. Lasers, uh, you know, are a great way to signal, actually. In fact, they might be better than radio in some instances because, you know, they're higher frequency if you're looking at them as electromagnetic signals. They're at higher frequency, shorter wavelength. And that means, just from information theory, you can get a lot more bits per second on a, a, a flashing laser than you can from a radio beacon. And if the idea is to educate everybody else in the galaxy or maybe sell your used cars to other other worlds or something like that, then you know more bits per second might be a good thing. People do look for flashing lasers in the sky. Uh, there are several experiments. The SETI Institute has one, but also the University of California, Berkeley has one. So that's another, another way to do it. Now, having said all that, and I'm getting close to my 15 minutes here, but there is the question of whether all of this is the correct thing to do. We're looking for the aliens. We don't know where they are. We don't know what technology they have, but presumably if it's worse than ours, we're not going to find them, right? So you have to hope that they're doing something that you can find. Um, but on the other hand, you know, are they going to broadcast anything into space, even a laser beam that they're using to communicate with their, you know, space colonies or something like that? It may be that it's it's dangerous to do that, right? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's dangerous, but, you know, Stephen Hawking commented on this once. Yeah, he, he thought says, so. Yeah, he thought it might be dangerous, um, but he didn't have any proof of that. And, you know, I, I don't know whether I think it's dangerous or not. Personally, I, I think I don't, only because the, uh, the Lord has arranged for the universe to be really big. And as a consequence, it's very hard to be a threat to somebody on another or in another star system. That's really hard. And it isn't just a matter of having dilithium crystals and uh, causing calling up Scotty in the engine room and telling him uh, warp six, Mr. Scott, or something like that. It's very hard to go from one place to another. So the amount of money that it would cost the Klingons to wipe out planet Earth is so high, I figured they're not going to do that. They're going to spend their money on something else. But be that as it may, there is the question of whether anybody would be broadcasting something and I think that the answer to that is probably yes, because otherwise they have to sort of tamp down the technological efforts of their own society in a way that hampers them, right? For a threat that's only hypothetical and probably not very threatening anyhow. So I think that that could be the case. Now, I'll, I'll just finish off by saying something about an alternative strategy, which uh, I kind of like, and that is this. I mean, we could listen for signals. We've been doing that. We'll continue to do that, whether they're flashing lasers or flashing radio transmitters or whatever. But on the other hand, there's a fundamental fact here that probably plays a role in all this, and that is the universe is three times as old as the Earth is, right? You, you know, for those of you who are old enough to remember the Big Bang, right, that was like 13 billion years ago. It was in all the papers, but, you know, that's, that's, that's a long time ago, right? 
And that means that unless life and intelligence are very rare, if they're, if they're, if, if they're miracles, okay, all bets are off. But if they're not a miracle, if what's happened on this planet has happened in many other places, then the majority of the aliens out there are more, are more technically advanced than we are. We're the stupid kids on the block. And uh, this is something that my neighbors will confirm at, a, at the drop of a hat. But in any, in any case, that's the point, that we're not the most advanced. We're the least advanced from their point of view. So what might they be doing that we might find? Well, they might be re-engineering their neighborhoods. For example, that's just an example. But maybe they build a Dyson sphere or something like that. Or maybe they just rearrange the stars nearby so that they can get more stellar energy for their gusto grabbing lifestyles, whatever. But they might be doing something that we can find simply by being alert to the fact that there's intelligence out there. It might be doing something to rearrange the cosmos. And without making any, any further assumptions, you just look for things that are unusual. I personally think that that's a good strategy. It doesn't tell you exactly what to look for, but it does tell you that if you're making pictures of the sky or doing some other astronomical uh, uh, research, of, you know, amateur or professional, either way, that if you find something that doesn't seem to make sense, it's not explicable, uh, you know, as nature at work, then that's a candidate for looking at in more detail as something that would prove that the aliens might be out there. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I have a couple of questions for you, and there were questions in the audience, but I think you answered most of them. Um, I got one. All right. After you, Scott. Well, uh, Seth, you made a prediction back in, what, 2012, that within 24 years that we would find extraterrestrial life. And what, 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 were, what was behind that? Right. Other than to provoke the audience. <laughs> yeah, it was. It got three people's attention. This was an audience of 850. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and I stand by that. I would still bet everybody a price of a cup of coffee that we'll find somebody by 2035. But it, you could say it's just wishful thinking, or maybe it's because, you know, Seth, you figure you'll be dead by then. You won't have to buy the coffee anyhow <laughs> or, or something like that. I mean, it could be any of those things, but it was actually based on something. If you plot up the speed of SETI searches, right, yeah. using some metric, uh, the number of channels you're monitoring or whatever, if you just plot that up versus time, you find out that this experiment is getting faster all the time, right? Mm -hmm. That's just the march of technology. And, uh, you know, it basically follows Moore's law, it kind of doubles in speed every couple of years, right? And so by the year 2035, I figured we would have looked at about a million star systems and uh for me at the time uh, in in some sort of drunken stupor i figured if you look at a million star systems i figured it was reasonably certain you would find something that you would find aliens one in a million star systems might have an alien society so that was the basis for the bet now i was willing to back that up to the tune of a cup of starbucks but not more all right all right um uh I think we have another question here from our presenters. So I, I was wondering if a race of a higher intelligence, in order to get that technologically advanced, they would have to be able to not destroy themselves. And, you know, as far as we're younger, much younger, but we might be dangerous, you know, hopefully uh, we'll evolve past the use of, you know, our nuclear weapons and stuff like that and make it to become, you know, a race that is space bearing and traveling outward when the sun eventually, you know, comes to an end, it'll have to be done. So we got to get busy now. <laughs> yeah. I, I think maybe what you were trying to suggest there is that to find aliens, there have to be some aliens. And it may be that once an alien society gets up to our technological level, yes, they've invented uh, radio or lasers and so forth, so they could make their presence known. But at the same time, you invent radio, you also invent the H-bomb, right? I mean, within 50 yeah. years. So maybe there aren't any aliens because the ones that are advanced enough for you to detect have all wiped themselves out. 
<laughs> this is this is kind of an optimistic view of uh, the universe, I have to admit. But uh, <laughs> unlike what Howard Hughes would have said, I don't buy it, it because I, I yes, maybe nine out of ten societies do themselves in. But do you think that all societies do that? That would no. be no. that would be remarkable. And you know, unless you think that that the development of intelligence is a very very unusual thing, uh, then there should still be plenty of people to to pick up on your antenna with your antenna, uh, even if uh, eighty percent of them decide to uh, destroy themselves. And also beyond that, I, I I just urge you sometime when you're not doing anything else, when you're just sitting on the streetcar or something. Just write down the uh, what you think are the probabilities that Homo sapiens will do itself in. I mean, just consider the possibilities. What is the possibility of a massive nuclear war next weekend? Uh, really ruin your weekend plans, right? And and then uh, what about a pandemic? And what about this? And what about social unrest? And what about you know uh, the, the danger from uh, used cars or whatever? Whatever you think are the existential threats. The Homo sapiens, write down and write down the probabilities, and uh, you, maybe you'll come out with the fact that you ought to, uh, you know, just take your life savings and go out and enjoy things now because there's no hope. I, many of my friends have opted for that strategy, or maybe you'll come to the same conclusion I did, which is that it's very, very difficult to kill everybody. You can try. I urge you to try, but it's really hard. You can get you can get rid of a third of all humans with a lot of effort, even if you let all the nukes fly right you get rid of about a third of everybody but it's hard to get rid of all of them and if you don't get rid of all of them you know it was just a bad weekend yeah yeah that's right that's right uh and you know with us at at the stage of our technical evolution you know we we are working on ai we we are working on nanotechnology you know uh, my thinking is uh, why would you send a fleshy out to uh, another planet? You know, I mean, if we found somehow found another planet and we had the technology to fly there in a reasonable amount of time, would we go down there? I mean, you know, you don't know what diseases might be there. You don't know many things, you know, maybe the culture, you know, you say something wrong and, you know, you get beat up or something. I don't know. But and the robot that happens on <laughs> Earth right now. But uh, yeah, it seems to me that uh, we that you know we might send something that's very small, extremely intelligent, and could last. You know. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the alien space programs, such as they are, and obviously the data set for that uh, question is rather minimal. But uh, I, I think you make a good point. In fact, a more fundamental point is that we assume that the aliens, you know, the little gray guys with big eyeballs and no last yeah. names it, 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 they're you know either they're friendly or they're unfriendly but they're basically humans with no eyelids right right and that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense humanoid. to me, I think. yeah humanoid <laughs> <laughs> right exactly but look the probably the most important thing that's going to happen in this century is that we invent our successors uh you know not chat gpt but you know that 30 generations farther along that the uh, the true intelligence of the universe is probably not soft and squishy anyhow, not fleshies. Mm. So, uh, you know, these are machines. And uh, if they get to their destination, they send back a whole lot of information and then they self-destruct or opt to play solitaire for the next 30 billion years. I mean, in, e- in neither case is it terribly interesting to us. All right. There's, there's a couple more questions here um, uh, from the audience. Uh, is it fathom, fathomable, sorry, uh, to believe that we are actually the most advanced species out there? That was actually my question, Scott. Yeah. And uh, I just jumped onto the call. Um, and yeah, my question. Um, I, we, we tend to assume that there are more intelligent species out there. And I'm thinking, what if we're at the top of the food chain, at least okay. in this galaxy? No yeah, way. well, I mean, it seems a little on. I, f- I find it, it's it's a bit self-serving, of course. Yeah. You know, we're just the smartest things going. Uh, we've we got a galaxy of two or three hundred billion star systems, and we're it. We're the crown of creation. 
uh, humans have often thought that they've always thought that actually yeah. and most people think that too because the first you know 15 years of their life there were these other entities we refer to them as parents who were telling them hey you're just the best there ever was right so they begin to believe it but you know there's there's something called the principle of mediocrity in science and it isn't a reflection on the scientists themselves so much as to say that if you think you're special you're probably wrong so that yeah. would be my response to that uh, norm hughes watching on youtube uh, wanted to know how long you monitor a system before moving on to another system. Yeah, that's a good question. What we do is we, we point at a nearby star system, say it's 20 light years away, whatever, and we observe it over a range of frequencies. This is, you know, a limitation of the equipment. Can't look at the entire radio spectrum simultaneously. You can only look at a certain chunk of it. That's a money problem, but the money is not of interest to anybody on this call, even though it's the primary concern of people who are actually in this field. But having you know look for typically three or four minutes that's it three or four minutes at any given set of frequencies you usually march the equipment up the dial and look at another several hundred million or billion channels for another three or four minutes so et has three or four minutes in the entire history of the universe three no. or four minutes to get in touch with us and if that signal doesn't reach us during that period of time we move on how about alpha centauri well, I, I mean, how about it? Seems good to Four, me, but... 15 minutes and nothing. Yeah, no, we, we, we almost always, whenever we can, uh, put Alpha Centauri at the top of the observing list because for all the obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, you have to do some SETI investigation here in the Southern Hemisphere too. Yes, well, that, that's, oh, that was the point I was just going to make. You, you can't <laughs> use uh, too many telescopes around here, but we, we started our observing years ago for Project Phoenix, 1995 at the Parks Radio Observatory in Australia. And of course, mm. it was easy enough to pick up Proxima Centauri, except they were they were being coy. There was they weren't broadcasting our way. And, and another question, we'll make this the last one. What are what are the reliable sources to look for in, in extraterrestrial life? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. You could ask the aliens, what, of course. What are the reliable sources to look for? Yeah, Maybe they mean like reliable sources for information you know? on how SETI is going. Yeah, is that is is that your reading of the question, Scott? Uh, what Molly just I'm reading said? the question from the chat. Yeah, I mean there are lots and lots of uh, articles you can read, also books. There there are several books. I I hesitate to recommend my own book, but if you do uh, decide to check that out of the library, I get nothing for that. If you buy the book, I get I think uh, the price of. Uh, in and out burger uh, order of fries. So uh, you might want to consider doing that. But uh, there's no shortage of information. There's lots, lots of stuff. If you're interested in the latest doings, then you're going to find that online, not in the in the library. And um, uh, how can people support SETI? Well, I hate to sound mercenary, but uh, the thing they can do that helps the most is just to send a check. Um, but, you know, Failing that, I mean, there are lots of things you can do. You can, if you, it, it depends on what your day job is. If your day job is to, uh, you know, run astronomy magazine or something like that. I mean, there are other things you can do. <laughs> but uh, in general, there was a very popular program called SETI at Home that was run oh. out of the University of California, oh, yeah. Berkeley. I've yeah. heard about it. Yeah, I've done yeah. that for many years. Yeah, I've yeah. They had that. like 7 million people downloaded that software and they were, you know, grinding away on SETI data. Now, mind you, it was a small fraction of the total SETI data. And uh, the real problem with it was not that it wasn't a good idea, not that it wasn't well implemented. The real problem was that it required at least one person full time to, to, to run it, actually, yeah. because there were always people who were having trouble with, you know, they try and download the software and it just wipes their hard drive clean and stuff like that. They had to, they had to deal with that. So it was the support cost that eliminated. It was a great, great idea, but unless you have very secure funding, it's, it's hard to do. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Seth. And uh, uh, next next week, uh, Seth will be back on again. Um, and yeah. um, 
uh, I, I'm really excited about this. He will be our co-host for the uh, 118th Global Star Party. So thanks again for all of your support with us here. Great. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Seth. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. So my mind's like filled with, you know, yeah. trying to ask Seth about 100 more questions. But uh, uh, we are going to look at more live uh, views of the universe with Molly Wakeling and uh, with her infusion of, uh, of science that she does with her astronomy talks. And um, uh, it, I, it's also uh, worth noting that uh, Molly is uh, now a team uh, member of Astronomy Magazine. So very cool. Uh, she's done a lot with her uh, life so far, and I can hardly wait to see what's next with Molly Wakeling. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be writing for Astronomy Magazine, and uh, my first article is coming out in August on their uh, on their anniversary. So, um, uh, really excited about that. And uh, yeah, it's about um, doing astrophotography without a telescope, so to, and kind of make astrophotography accessible. So, uh, yeah, look out for that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, before I launch into, I'm going to talk about the Heart Nebula tonight. But okay. because it's clear here, I do want to um, share my screen again briefly. But instead of the moon, I have the Owl Nebula up now oh, that's um, nice. Nice in uh, my, yeah. my nightly imaging sequence. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nice out tonight. The moon's not too bright and it's about halfway full. But this is on the other side of the sky right now. And uh, I've got a nice um, uh, dual band, uh, narrow band filter in here, the Optolong L Ultimate, that's uh, kind of making it pop out pretty nice. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to stacking a whole bunch of those. And um, I haven't imaged this this target in a while since I've gotten better equipment and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to getting a nicer image of it. And another thing I wanted to share is uh, I've just 3D printed a uh, an orrery, a, a tellurium specifically. Oh, that's cool. Uh, with the, um, so the sun, earth, moon system. And you can calibrate it so it's actually like correct for the date where the moon is, the tilt of the moon. Um, it's like distance from the earth and stuff like that. Um, and uh, this axis here on the earth shows like um, uh, the equinoxes and the solstices and stuff. So I did I did not design this, uh, but I printed it and it came out really nice. <laughs> and it's on a, it's on a, a printables if you search for mechanical orrery printables.com. But yeah, this is a lot of fun. So I thought I'd show that off too. <laughs> cool. um, yeah, that looks, Molly, that looks awesome. But if it were... The actual scales and distances, how far away would that sun or be from oh, your goodness. house? Um oh, I, I've I've done this before for like like some library some public library talks I've given with like relative distances for planets and stuff, but I don't remember offhand uh kind of what that would be, but some number of miles, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sun would be like in Hawaii or something. I, uh, I don't know if it's, I think it's a, maybe. I, I don't different. remember uh, what what my scale reference was the last time I did this exercise. I think it might have been that the sun was a was a um, either a ping pong ball or a tennis ball. I can't remember. <laughs> in any case, uh, anyway. uh, big big distances involved here. Um, yeah. So let me share my screen and I'll do my astronomy's universe segment on a target that um is is I've, I've got one of my one of my favorite and best images on this target that i'll show at the end um and this one here is one of my earlier images on it that i'm also quite happy with but i have a hubble palette one now that came out really nice that i'll show at the end but um i uh, thinking about looking looking at the topic for tonight on the Big Bang and talking about nucleosynthesis, how we all started from just the hydrogen and helium and tiny bit of lithium content at the very beginning. Uh, thinking about the hydrogen, maybe think about nebula and stellar nurseries. And I thought, well, I should just do the heart nebula because I haven't done that one yet. Uh, yeah, so the heart nebula is a massive emission nebula. So um, it's got gases in it, primarily hydrogen, that are being energized by stars within the nebula and causing it to glow this deep red. 
And it looks a little more pink in a lot of images because there's a lot of white starlight and that makes the deep red look more pink because white and red is pink. Um, so you kind of get this, this pink color like you do for prominences on the edge of the sun during solar eclipses. Um, it is a solar nursery, so new stars are born here and uh, new, eventually new planetary systems and maybe eventually uh, those planetary systems might host some life. So there could eventually be some uh, and then like there is the uh, stars drift out of the nebula and kind of go on their merry ways. Um, and not only does it contain hydrogen, but also oxygen and sulfur, which also glow on the optical spectrum, a whole host of other gases and what astronomers call metals. Metals to astronomers are anything that is heavier than helium. <laughs> So <laughs> lithium's a metal, argon and neon are metals. It's really silly, um, but uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And then uh, molecular dust as well. There's not just elements uh, in, floating out in space, but there's a lot of organic compounds and uh, different molecules that um, are floating out there as well, which is really fascinating. And a lot of radio astronomy studies what the dust is made up of because you have to see the radio wavelength vibrations of those molecules Sorry. in order to determine what they are. Um, so uh, if you want to go looking for it, it is up off the end of the left or bottom or top, depends on the time of year, <laughs> side of Cassiopeia, kind of be sort of between Cassiopeia and kind of forming a triangle with Perseus. It's quite a large nebula. Um, but uh, right now it's getting more towards setting in the early evening sky. I'm imaging it on one of my camera lenses tonight until about 11 o'clock and then it'll be too low to see. Um, so it's really a good wintertime target and we're getting out of wintertime moving into spring. So some fast facts. Uh, it's listed as magnitude 18.3, which sounds really dim. And it is, but you know, it's the way that the magnitudes are calculated. If the tar if the target is really spread out and really large on the sky, like the Heart Nebula is, then it has a much lower magnitude. Uh, and this covers 150 by 150 arc minutes of apparent size, which is like um, two and a half degrees wide. So take like um, let's see, one, two, three, like, like five or six of your thumbnails wide go across the sky or like five or six moons side by side. Um, it, it's quite large on the sky. If, if we could see it, um, it, it would be very large. It's 7,500 light years away and is 165 light years across. So uh, remembering that light is traveling uh, really fast, and it takes 165 light years for it to cross this whole nebula. Uh, it's not only large on the sky, but it's physically an enormous nebula here in our here in our own galaxy. And it was discovered by William Herschel in 1787, um, but probably not the nebula itself, but probably the the cluster, the star cluster at the middle. Um, but there is some bright there are some brighter portions of the nebula that you could see a little more easily in telescopes. So um, there's a lot going on in the Heart Nebula. This is not one of my images. I pulled this one off of Wikipedia because I don't have a nice full field image of it yet. I will have one once I process the data set I'm currently taking on my Rokinon camera lens. But uh, let's talk about some of what we've got going on here. So here in the middle is what I think is the most interesting portion, one of the most interesting portions of the Heart which is what I call the heart of the heart, uh, kind of at the, at the core of the heart nebula there. And you, you can really see that this nebula has a heart shape when you photograph it. And it's just, it's so obvious a heart shape that even people who are really bad at seeing shapes in like constellations and nebula like I am can see that it's a heart. So <laughs> that makes it convenient. Um, so the middle here is um, the heart of the heart or has its own designation of IC 18005. And the star cluster there is known as Malat 15. Uh, this, these are some uh, really young stars, um, like only one and a half million years old, which is like newborn star. Uh, so a lot of really young stars here. And that's why it has such intricate shapes is because hot young stars are emitting tons of ultraviolet light. And that's energizing and shaping the nebula gases here um, and causing them to glow really brightly. It's like the brightest part of the, almost the brightest part of the nebula here. Um, here we have the uh, a section that is called uh, the Fish Head Nebula, which I just finished imaging. Uh, these two images on either side are, are my images, 
Um, and the fish head nebula is, I think, I think I read it as the brightest portion of the nebula. You can kind of see this one in a telescope with, uh, when using like a nebula filter. Um, we have, uh, then there's a lot of dark nebula regions that are named. There's a lot of named features here or um, cataloged features. LDN 1371, LDN 1365. Um, uh, Markarian 6 is actually a little um, open cluster here that, that kind of stands out once, once you see it. Uh, you can't unsee it. Uh, so our, a little open cluster there that's um, uh, not bright enough to have ended up on Messier's or other popular catalogs. LDN 1366 over here, LDN 1364 over here. <laughs> it's really been chopped up and divvied up. Uh, and then this like section of nebula here actually has its own de designation, which I thought is cool because it is a very cool looking section. Uh, you can see part of it here um, on uh, CG, CG, CG7S. DN. DN meaning dark nebula, even though there's a lot of glowing nebula there in addition to the dark nebula. Um, and yeah, I, I only named part of the, uh, only showed part of the cataloged regions here. There's quite a few. Um, but yeah, that's kind of some of the anatomy of the heart nebula, if you will. I like to show what these objects look like in other wavelengths because we see so many pictures in optical wavelengths, but really when it comes to stars and anything that gets energized by starlight, it's emitting on all wavelengths across, across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, some a lot more than others, and you have to have high enough temperatures to do things like x-rays and gamma rays and stuff like that. Um, but uh, here is a radio image uh, with the, um, the Planck uh, spacecraft and 157 gigahertz, if, if you're a radio person, that number means something to you. It's actually pretty high frequency. Um, this is, if you imagine that I took the heart nebula image and turned it up on its side, that's the orientation of this image, where you can actually, like this is a pretty high resolution image, you can see kind of that heart shape and some of the brighter areas with like the fish head nebula and stuff. So that's kind of cool that you can still kind of make out the heart shape in the radio data. That doesn't always happen. Uh, this is the infrared image from um, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Uh, this, so this is uh, infrared data that has been colored to be on an optical spectrum that we can actually look at on a computer. So the blue cyan region is where new stars are being born. The green areas are grains of dust that are heated by starlight. And the red areas are like larger dust grains that are um, glowing at a much longer infrared wavelength. And I forgot to put the unit on there, but it's all microns, um, these different infrared wavelengths. Uh, getting up into the higher energies here, uh, the uh, but either an ultraviolet or X-ray, there wasn't really a complete image of that area, just lots of little sporadic squares uh, where particular target targets had been imaged for particular scientific goals. So on the left, we have ultraviolet from uh, the SWIFT telescope up in space, up at um, uh, just about 200 nanometers of wavelength. And then up in the X-ray, we have a color image made up of three different uh, at wavelengths are here listed as energies, uh, as we tend to do for X-rays, of um, uh, X-ray energies, but again, just kind of in little chunks. And these are really just kind of like really hot stars that are newborn and um, are so hot they can emit x-rays. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot of nebula shape here because nebula is just not quite hot enough to emit on UV and x-ray a lot of the time. And then finally, there is actually some gamma ray signal up there. So gamma rays are the most energetic kind of light, uh, by far and away more energetic than x-ray. And um, uh, this image from the Fermi telescope up in space kind of shows a bright area roughly where um, that not, it, it, the images don't always line up perfectly in this software that I'm using called Aladdin, but um, I think this kind of approximately lines up with, with the the knot in the middle, the heart of the heart, and then kind of the fish head-ish region over here. So there's some really hot stars and, and activity going on there to emit gamma rays, um, which is pretty cool. And I'll have to dig into on a future talk at some point, uh, what kind of processes produce gamma rays. So if you want to observe the heart nebula, um, it's really hard to see visually. Um, but the time of year is September to March. 
So a cracker in the fall and the winter and a little bit into spring. Hydrogen being red in wavelength is really hard for us to see because our eyes are not very sensitive to red. So you're not going to be able to see this one with binoculars like you would the Andromeda galaxy. Um, now, if you're under very dark skies and you have a telescope and you have a nebula filter, you might be able to see some of the brighter parts of the nebula, like um, uh, the heart of the heart or the fish head region uh, with that telescope. Um, but it's... a I haven't tried this myself uh, looking for this target, but from what I'm reading, it's not the easiest to discern. Uh, but the star cluster in the middle, Malot 15, is really easy to see with, uh, with binoculars, it being a nice, bright, open cluster. However, photographically, it's pretty bright, and you don't need a whole lot to photograph it. Uh, I've done it at all different wavelengths of my telescopes. Um, you can do wide field to get the whole nebula, uh, your super wide field to get the heart and the soul nebula. Or you can zoom in on particular parts of it, like the fish head or the heart of the heart. Um, if you do it in wideband, it's just all red, like the picture in the background. So it makes, it, but it actually makes a really excellent narrow band uh, target for doing like Hubble palette kind of work. And uh, here's my image of the heart of the heart that I'm very proud of. It's my favorite image, and it just came out. Um, I got the colors exactly how I wanted them, and a lot of beautiful intricate detail. And uh, yeah, this was with my um, Celestron 8-inch schmidt cassegrain taken over the course of, um, from October of 2021 to February of 2022. And this is about 18 hours worth of images on a monochrome camera on the ZWO 1600. So Molly, was, some of, was any of your data taken from Okitex? Um, not for this one. Um, this was, uh, over the, the, the previous year. So, um, uh, I, the first time I went to Okitex was, was September of, uh, of 22 this past year. Well, okay. You said 21. Um, no, I'm still very impressive. Yeah. I, I got my ears mixed up, but, uh, yeah, that's yeah, still yeah. very impressive. Yeah. Actually, this hours. was, this was all done from my Bortle, my Bortle seven, uh, backyard. Um, yeah. yeah, that time frame I was here in, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, but narrow band, I use three nanometer, three nanometer filters and it just knocks out every kind of light pollution. I just need to like not have the moon be too close to it because it can bleed over into the oxygen channel a little bit. Um, but yeah, narrow band, if you live somewhere really bright like I do, you can get images of a quality that you would get from darker skies. Uh, and it keeps me going sometimes when the wideband galaxies and trying to image from the city are coming out really nasty. So <laughs> narrow band is, is really nice yeah. to have as well. Yeah, I, I see how that works now. So that that's why I'm seeing such great nebula images from Portal 7, Portal yeah. 8, city, urban. So that, yeah. now that makes sense. It's all about that narrow band. And yeah, now we're getting into galaxy season. There's very few narrow band targets. There's not much planetary nebula. There's no emission nebula really. Because we're looking up out yeah. of the plane of the galaxy and out toward like outer space, out toward right. away from the galaxy. So we pretty much just have other galaxies to look at in this spring season. Um, so that just means that I got to take a lot, a lot, a lot of subframes to get enough signal to noise ratio to make nice galaxy images. But we'll see what well, I can there's do. Always, yeah, there's always M82. You've got a little bit to work with there. Yeah, so I'm actually yeah. doing that right now with um, the, uh, I'm doing it, I just finished, I think I just wrapped it up on my Takahashi where I've taken a bunch of hydrogen alpha. I think I'm still getting yeah. some energy on there actually. Um, and then uh, on my HHD, my, my nine and a quarter, I've got this new filter from Antlia called the Antlia, I'm going to get the words, Antlia Ultra RGB Tri-Band. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a wide band filter, like yeah. a light pollution filter, but it's got more in the red and it's really cut out where the light pollution is. It's a really interesting filter. It's like a combination yeah. of a, of a wide band filter and a hydrogen alpha filter. Um, okay. So, so they really zero in with... on. They zero in on all the frequencies for for light pollution, and you're talking about like city light pollution, tungsten. Yeah. You're talking about whatever the LEDs throwing cuts all of that out. Yeah, yeah. So it cuts out cool. a, a decent amount of light pollution, but passes a lot of red still, and um, it's it's definitely got some potential for being a being good for galaxies where you can still get the wideband signal from galaxies, but also get a lot of the hydrogen signal and block out a lot of the light pollution. 
Um, so I put a, put together a couple images with it. I'm really looking forward to doing M82 with this with this filter. So yeah, and you know, there's a, like M101 and M33 where they've got a bunch of uh, yeah regions. I'm wondering how that'll turn out. I mean, you yeah. may not get much of the nucleus, but all the arm you might get arm data that pops out. I, you know, I don't know, but yeah, I, I might did be test some it. Interesting targets yet. I did test it on. I don't remember which galaxy I did, but I tested it on a galaxy, and I needed more data than I would have normally needed for just doing wideband because it does have some stronger cuts around the light. But I do get enough wideband signal to be able to image a galaxy, which is kind of its its selling yeah. point. It's like being able to cut light pollution, but still be able to do galaxies in some reasonable amounts of color. So, um, yeah, we'll see what comes out. That should be up relatively yeah. soon. I have a bunch of subframes cool. on it. Is that your eight inch you used for the Jupiter Saturn conjunction? On, yes. Uh, the, yes, I thought so. You <laughs> trapped into the fence in the tree from your house. I remember. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, uh, kind of shooting great, around my uh, tree and above my scope. fence, and I got had my okay. eight inch, and it went really well. That's a sharp <laughs> scope you have there, buddy. See, Molly. <laughs> see, Molly. John's is... got us. John's got you beat. He just pulls out his thirty inch and he draws it straight from the thirty inch and his elevated uh you know if he doesn't just use mount wilson itself he pulls his 30 out and he draws the h2 regions on his uh oh my gosh, with his yeah. drawing so yeah he, he's got his all beat oh, that's man. my 32 or uh Mirko's 32 not a 30 but i am working 32 on so oh my goodness i, I have shorted you two, to show you. I shorted you two inches sorry I have gotten to look through a couple of 36 inch telescopes before one up at, um, at the hidden hollow star party here in Ohio and one down at Texas star party. And yeah, the views through those are exquisite, <laughs> just mind boggling. It's, it's so good. Uh, yeah. My aperture has stopped at 24. So That's I am cool. aperture good. Pride <laughs> on my visual astronomy. And so I'll just, I just take my can, my camera and I shoot the entire thing. That's my, uh, that's my, um, compromise. One day, one day I'll get to look at that stuff. You can Adrian, just come, come, come out Come here. with us to do. Yes, we need it. Yeah. The four horsemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a lot of travel I have to do. Molly, you, you've been fortunate enough to do some travel and see, some, through some of those scopes and I know you'll never forget I even though I'm a little more I'm advanced in years I still hope to do some of this traveling you know before and before the year of 80 so yeah it's got, totally I worth taking the passport. The... yeah I just got to get all my money together and come see all you guys yeah it's totally worth taking the the time and the and the money and the effort to come down to one of the major star parties um I'll be at Cherry Springs in June if, uh, if anyone else will be there uh, and take a oh, little cool. break from my PhD work to go to Cherry Springs. I can't go to Texas Star Party this year. It is too much of a time commitment to be away from my uh, my work. But um, Cherry Springs is a little bit shorter and a little bit closer. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably miss you at Okie, Texas. Yeah, again. I'll, I'll, be, you... I'll be moving. Are... I'm moving in September. I'm graduating in September and I'll be moving. Oh, yes, so yeah. That's can't important. make it. So, yeah, no. Well, it was good seeing you there last year. And I know you got some, you got some really good data. Uh, it did, yeah, and I'll be back yeah. another year. Yeah, one one year again. I um, my buddy from uh, the lowbrows. Um, I'll oh, mention yeah. his Jim Forster. Um, he he's going every year, and I tend to go with him. Um, love the skies down there, but but yeah, I do hope to travel to some other places, see the sky from some other areas because I it's been I think two years Okie Text now for me. Mm. Awesome. You gotta well, show us that owl. That owl is looking good. Um, the uh, the light. You want to see the live view again? Oh my. Yeah. Oh, uh, so my 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 telescopes have been beeping at me, and I wasn't sure which one of my four it was, but unfortunately, it's the one with the owl four. nebula. The guiding has run away for uh, oh, no. uh, reasons oh, unknowable. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can show you owl. Owl. what what I'm taking right now. Uh, real, real quick, here, oh. here's what happened. <laughs> Someone kicked the tripod. Something's gone wrong with the guiding, and I I don't know what. <laughs> no, you have clouds, or maybe it's like plants. Um, weird nebula, not the but, owl. But uh, yeah. yeah, we'll we'll get that back. And Nina has a a sweet center after drift 
uh, routine. So it's checking that now, seeing uh, what's wrong with it, and it'll, it'll recenter it here. So, um, uh, but yeah, so uh, at some, some point, I'll get the finished image out and I'm going to go diagnose what's going on with my guiders. So, but yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, the travails of astrophotography, even automation, does not always work. But uh, yep, if you yep. know how to troubleshoot your stuff like Molly, you'll be back up in no time. Uh, or you can be like everyone else and shine a big bright flashlight at your unit and wonder what the heck happened and blind all the visual astronomers and then a fight breaks out and it's not <laughs> such a good time. So it, know your equipment before you, go, before you go out and image in front of folks or try to build your own home observatory and learn. There's our lesson for tonight. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Molly. Yeah, and, you're welcome. Uh, good luck on your Hi, future adventures there. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, Bye, even after uh, doing automated imaging for the last, um, I've been doing it pretty solidly for about three years now. I still have troubles often, but when you run four rigs, something's That's inevitably great. going oh, to break. Yeah. Four I'm running four, yeah. four simultaneously, seen, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I've seen the four that's rig crazy. setup. It is quite impressive. <laughs> They're all pointing at different objects. The wow. computer, the computer's controlling everything. It's it's quite a, uh, it's quite a uh, setup. It, it, it's a very, it's, <laughs> it's a yeah, me, I walk around with just a single camera and, and a lot of jealousy because I don't have a four rig setup like that. But um, it, it serves its purpose very well. A lot of nights to get here. When I lived in California, yeah, I had yeah. clear nights very often, so I was able to just turn the crank yeah. on, getting all the problems worked out. It's it's the way to go because you're not stuck with one object. You've got you can go four different objects. So you're you know you've got an interest in a couple different areas of the sky. You go to all of them and um, yeah, and gather data. So yeah, it's a little bit of jealousy but no i understand completely it, it, it's it's a great setup and it took you some time to get there i'm sure yeah yeah but it's been a blast and i'm just uh i'm so pleased that i'm able to to do this on a on a regular basis and um and and when one rig doesn't doesn't work one night i still have three other ones so it wasn't a total loss you know that's right very good point all right i've monopolized a lot of time so <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Molly, I, I want to show you before you leave. If you, I'll, you, I'll if hang you, out for a little bit, yeah. If you scroll, allow me, I can show you what I'm capturing right now to give a live view like you did re uh, recently. Uh, let me share my screen. Do you see? This is the, uh, the, the software of ACR Plus. And right now I'm taking this picture. This is before it gets married and flip, but this is the auto stretching image oh, wow. of the Carina yeah. Nebula. And Beautiful. you can see here the, uh, the box Nebula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, this is a, a, a three minutes single salt. And here's wow. the myst, uh, Mystic Mountain that you show hmm. in, the, huh. in the video, Scott. Right. Let's see oh. when, when I get uh, the, pro the process how it is but anyway this is really great. quick maxi is that area to the left the area that jwst honed in on yes this is the place yeah. but um the another one was in the northern but uh, in the part of the northern uh, Canina Nebula. part of the nebula. yeah and in a really really small part but anyway fantastic yeah that's going to be really nice. I hope so. I hope so. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm struggling that, with the that wind. That's really Definitely good. Definitely coming along. Yeah, you keep getting subframes like that. You'll have a nice image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do you, so, do you use, Maxi, do you use Blur Exterminator to work on, you know? Yeah, to, I started to work yeah. with that. And it's, yeah, I, I, it's amazing too. I just downloaded it recently. So I'm going to, I finally gave in. I caved. And uh, I got Star Exterminator for working on the comet that came through recently because I could mm -hmm. take the stars out of linear images, which Starnet won't do. I won't do well. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to see how Blur Exterminator works on my stuff. And it's I've seen incredible results on some other people's stuff. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to seeing this, Maxi. Yeah, that's 
right. it's thank, been you, a, thank you, Max. I think the fervor has died down over Blur Exterminator. Yeah, so it's it Guys, that's we have um, we have Marcello, Souza, and some more speakers here waiting in the wings. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. should need to uh, move right. on. But uh, all right, uh, we'll uh, we'll come back to you, Maxie, if you're still uh, imaging. Well, I I be capturing the same <laughs> object I think all night, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Great. So our next speaker is Mar uh, Marcelo Souza from Brazil. Um, he is um, he organizes an, uh, an event called the IMAA, um, which uh, attracts an international group of uh, uh, you know science professionals and amateurs in the fields of astronomy and space exploration. Um, he is uh, also the uh, editor of Skies Up Magazine. Uh, we're putting together our next issue right now and uh, putting some final touches on that. Uh, Marcello, thank you for coming on Global Star Party. Hi, thank you very much for the invitation, Scott. Thank you. Hi to all of you. Hi, Marcello. Uh, nice to meet all Hello, of you Marcia. again. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, congratulations, Max, for the, now you are and thank ambassador. you, thank you, Marcelo. <laughs> <laughs> now, thanks to Scott for letting let it happen. And I will share some. First, I will show what we are doing. Right? We continue visiting schools here, and we have news about what we are doing here. This is our astronomy club, and this was Thursday. Right? We visit another school. Monday, we visit another one, and this Thursday, you have activity in another school. Here you see how are the classrooms here in public schools here in Brazil. This is a school that they have air conditioning, they have a projector. Then the schools are here in our state are better now. They have all the support for the teachers in class. And we develop this project, the Young Stars Tomorrow. We talk about astronomy, space exploration, new technologies. We teach the students how to produce uh, apps for smartphones and the, how to, yeah, we also produce uh, animate, anim, I don't know if it's correct in English, but animated cartoons for TV. Uh, we produce six episodes that uh, already were, were transmitted in, a local TV here, the first time that you have a animated cartoon about astronomy here in Brazil. And uh, uh, now I'm studying what's happening with the sun. Uh, I know that the United States, probably most of you saw the aurora. I don't know. Did you see, Scott, the aurora in your state? No? Because I have here information that they saw in Florida and in many different states. In here is our star. And now I will talk about the cycle, the solar cycle 25. But this is always the prediction for this new one, the 25. They predicted that the maximum probably will happen in July 2025. And it was almost the same as was the last one, that was the 24. But I have data now that shows that I probably will be more intense than was predicted. Then I will show now the information that I have. This is the prediction from NOAA. And here is spaceweatherlive.com. I will have graphs that shows what's happening now with the sun. You can see here uh, the um, mean sunspot number is the blue one, uh, smooth. smooth. Uh, here is the this black here is the mean sunspot number, and you see here what's happened in 2023. Here in the 
you see the prediction. And uh, now you know, we can see that uh, uh, probably you have a more intense activities happening in the sun, in this period. And you have uh, maybe earlier the maximum of this cycle. Uh, nobody knows what will happen, but uh, the data uh, probably shows that uh, we can predict that we have uh, more intense activity this year. And uh, this is the sunspot number, it is the radio flux. And you see here that you have an intense activity in 2023. Yeah. In these only three months in 2023, you the sun is very active. And uh, I don't know if it will be the same that you have in 2023, but probably it will be more intense than the 24. Right? And here you we can see that you have many X class flares, M flares, C flares, then the sun is very active. And the last week, we had this big hole, a coronal hole, and nobody predicted that you have an intense coronal mass ejection arriving here in, in our planet. And I don't know if you saw no? this. Uh, it's not working. But here is the image in spaceweather.com from the, someone that registered the auroras in Florida. It's something unexpected. You have auroras in Florida. I don't know if any one of you here is an image from the Inquas group that is available in the spaceweather.com. That's Aurora in Nebraska. Then it was very wow. intense in 23, March 23. Nice. And you can see here, it's quite something that's fantastic. You see here the colors. You have yeah. the green one, yeah. blue, and the other one. If you go to Florida, you, you can't see the green one. You see only the red one here. That's right. Yeah, I was so uh, because sad. it's south. You go to south. It was, but it, right, sorry. Uh, it was cloudy and raining here in Ohio. Otherwise, I would have seen it. And I've never, <laughs> never seen the aurora. <laughs> <laughs> never seen it. No, I haven't. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> this. I hope. I think that is something fantastic. I never seen else. But uh, this was in Nebraska, uh, and uh, they saw in Florida, and, uh, and it was an unexpected activity. Uh, yes. no, nobody predicted that this would happen. And this it was the most intense storm in 20 years. Then I, I believe that uh, we have uh, probably um, more, more intense ejections from the sun this year. <clears throat> I, so, I hope that you don't have a, another effect like you ha we had in the 19th century, right? but uh, maybe it can happen. Sorry? Sorry, someone? No. No? That this is what you, uh, uh, we need to be concerned now. Right? And another thing that uh, I'm uh, analyzing here, because we have our events uh, at the end of April. Yes, the wow. artifi artificial oh satellites. <coughs> this is, a, is a, 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 a representation of satellites and the space junk is also together. Right? This is what we have in, around us. But uh, now, and we have uh, more than 5,000 active satellites. And from these 5,000 active satellites, more than 3,000 are, sp are SpaceX satellites. They are from the Star Starlink satellites. Starlink. Then this is what we need to be concerned. And the prediction is then from 2030, probably we have more than 
100,000 satellites. Not. Wow. You're going to need software to remove those out of your <laughs> photographs if you can make it. it be a... Yes, yes. This <laughs> is what I'm concerned. This is a picture of the Starlink. Starlink. Satellites. Yes. From February 20, 2023, I have more than 3,000. And uh, I don't know how much they are planning to, to launch. No? Then you have a modern, a lot of fleets oh. of Starlinks no? that you can see in the sky. Then it's something that you need to discuss now that uh, is to avoid this influence for us. No? Uh, as a different kind of light pollution no? that you have. And uh, they are planning to launch <laughs> The Blue Walk. Already launched, you have one of these in orbit of Earth. That's the Blue Walk fleet. Uh, the, uh, they have 64 square meters of uh, this panel, solar panels. Right? Wow. It's a very big one. They are planning to launch many of these right, in low orbit. And this will affect us. You imagine a 60. Four square meter solar panel. Many of these satellites in low orbit, in Earth low orbit. You can imagine how they, they will reflect the light from the sun and how we will affect us. You know? uh, like iridium satellites, you'll get flashed on the ground. Yes. This is, is on an image the, the product in when it was finishing the production of the, sat of the satellites. It's a very big one, it's a very big one. And the, uh, I have here a video. This is an image showing how it will be in art, but this is the video produced by the company showing how it was produced the, the satellites. It's a very big one. When they open all the solar panels, it's a very big one. And you have one in orbit. And they are planning to launch more of this. Then we need to be concerned because uh, probably to make studies, we need to have uh, space telescopes, right? to have clear images. It's a very big one. And it's already working in Earth Earth. This is another kind of light pollution that you, you, you need to be concerned. How to solve this? No? And don't affect the use of new technologies here. Then we have some kinds of proposals, if you can use some kinds of uh, painting that reflects less the light that comes from the sun, this is also. And something that you need to talk with the, these groups that are producing satellites to preserve the sky for us. No? Then to avoid you see this uh, all the days man, that you look to the sky. I don't know. I, I, I read some groups that are trying to estimate the influence of these satellites that are already in orbit in our view to the sky. And I uh, have groups working in this. No? I don't know what's happening in a near future with these big satellites in orbit. And now, in this period, we are organizing our international events here. These are the link né, for our event. We have from April 27, 29, here in our city, the fifth event. We have now the confirmation of more speakers. Uh, Gabe Gabriel, that he is a fantastic uh, speaker. He worked at NASA, Beth Meyer Foot for International Dark Sky Association. We have here near us the first Dark Sky Park of Latin America. 
And now we are working to have another dark sky place that is another preserved forest near us that they already assumed the compromise, the commitments uh, to preserve the sky for the new generations. Then we have a new one, probably will be announced during the events. Uh, uh, Yanni Roberstad, that she is the coordinator of the Global Science, Science Opera, is a project that associates science with arts, uh, using music for this. And the topic of this year is the James Webb Telescope. Then many different countries produce music and uh, sketches, a theater uh, sketch for the, the opera that is transmitted live with the participation from students from different countries. And here from our city, you have three, from our country, you have three seats that <coughs> participate. And this is Demerval, that is from the North region of Brazil. He is coordinating the observation of the eclipse, annular eclipse here in Brazil. Uh, he lives in, in Ceará, that is a state where you have the opportunity to see the annular eclipse in October. Nel Stravnik, that is one of the most recognized uh, Brazilian amateur astronomers, he, he built three observatories in different cities in São Paulo. Eduardo Penteado, that is uh, one of the coordinators of the uh, Office of Astronomy for Education from the International Astronomical Union. And now we have the participation of Ed Jekesen that comes from Mozambique to talk about astronomy in Mozambique. He, work, he has an astronomy club there. Né? And he also participates in a group from Africa that is a Pan-African citizen science né? that involves persons from different countries in Africa. Alejandro Sommer from Argentina. He is representative of the International Dark Sky Association in Argentina. And he also uh, developed projects with indigenous in Argentina about astronomy. Julio Fabres, that's a famous Brazilian cosmologist. This is our event né, that will happen soon. And it, this is the link for the last edition of Skies Up. And I, I think that soon, we have a new edition, right, Scott? Yes. I think that it is almost, is almost right. <laughs> yeah. And here, my my daughter, I ever remember this image that shows the importance of making the uh, outreach activities, no? Yeah. So showing the, the sky for her door. And now she knows how to use the telescope. And she also make it, organize it, uh, when you have person to we have a lot to reach activity, she helped me uh, with the, the telescopes. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Marcello, it's a great thank pleasure you to much. be with thank you. you. Thank you. Thank for you, Marcello. The, uh, nice nice to you. meet all of you. <laughs> I love to see young people getting involved in astronomy, you know, and uh, there is a, a long tradition in this world of fathers showing their children the sky. So, um, so that's that's awesome. Okay, so uh, up next is um, we have uh, Cesar Brolo from Argentina. And from Argentina, yes, yes that's dude. right. Yes. That's right. So uh, <laughs> clear. It looks like uh, you might have some clear sky in your. Are you clear in sky, clear sky. Uh, uh, a night of uh, open, open clusters. Uh, we can, we can make a. Um, as you know, I am totally wrapped by buildings, as you can see, and I have very small part of the skies where I can or in my telescopes. Mm -hmm. This is safe, it's something for the people that never, never lose the opportunity of in a, in a, a clear night, of course, uh, to watch the sky, um, traveling by the sky, 
using uh, any any uh, sky map software mm -hmm. your computer and choosing what you are able to watch um, before uh, after sorry watch the incredible picture from Molly and Maxi of course that for me what I don't know I that I have but okay um, I can show you some tonight only uh, some uh, open clusters actually let me let me share screen well These now m46 now, well in, in, in this moment uh, in this moment, I can stack in. I I stack in. Let me let me stop and I can show you with much better. That's a live stacking mode, so you have yes. it all programmed and ready. Yes, of course. Beautiful. It's gonna build up, huh? Let me. And a moment you said that we saw streaks on the screen. Oh my god. Uh oh. I think you jinxed it, John. Yeah. Oh no. It, it, Caesar's got nice. this apartment building wired. He'll be fine. Okay. Very true. Oh my god. Let me well, I I I lost maybe because guiding. Yes, my, my telescope the mode was the disconnect. Oh. But maybe no. <clears throat> maybe the next. Let's see what the next frame shows. Yeah, that guy that did the nebula, the homunculus nebula. He oh doesn't my. need a track. Yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, earthbound nebula. I, I, I lost everything, but but, uh, but maybe oh. yes, because nope. it's. What it's the, the uh, wireless or, or your connection? No, those are off. No, no. What's that? Uh, uh, maybe you can see the, the light. It, it's, it's moving the, the cable. Um, now it's totally disconnected. And, you know, oh, no. I, we lose the, the, yes, the track. Yes, yeah, so it looks like you lost your tracking there. Yes, but, absolutely. But, but I can show, show us you. one you did. I'm sure no you problem. have No problem. Yes, I have, I have the. No problem, you, no problem. What cluster yes. is that, by the way? Uh, this one, let me change this. It's got some nice red stars in there. Yeah, actually. Can yeah, see yeah, we can see the color. colors of these stars. Yeah, yes. that's pretty yes. good. Yeah, we. Yeah, this is the real astrophotography. No. Sometimes we lose <laughs> the rig and yes, we got to uh, figure out what happened. Most Absolutely, the most the most funny was that in the entire night I don't have any problems. Yep. But let me show uh -huh. you. Let Sorry, me show me this this guy. Yes. I don't know. I don't know why. Okay. That's it's southern a, dual No, no, it's a celestron because. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but the exos when I connect and disconnect. This could, happen, this could happen to any, any yeah, race. it happened. Uh, um, but, but, but it doesn't my, happen as much to explore scientific gear. No, no, yes, I don't know yes, if we can. Like <laughs> Sorry, so, but my, um, my, my Exus, when it's unplugged, I'm, um, I plug again, it's like a nothing. It's still, it's still tracking. I don't know why. Wow. Yes, this one I don't know. Uh, Come on, you're in the south. Why? Yeah. <laughs> you lose everything. Where? Let me let me change this and I can show you. Or are you are you running yeah. off of? No, uh, no. I I used a a, a, a plug a that battery. is not the exactly size and right. was like a, a, a this a small disconnect and lose totally. But the tracking, but it's ridiculous because the tracking, it's um, something that let me. Oh, you can on. push that thing, probably. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's Nico the Hammers thing. Oh, Nico, sorry. Yeah. yeah yes, the, yes. Um, we need a Nico. One hundred. The Nico reason why the man. Absol to Absolutely, sure. Because it's a problem that Nico never, never have. 
Right. No, no, no. This is yeah. yeah. Let me show you what are that I I had in in my in your collection of beautiful works. Yeah. Hey, the Southern Jewel Box is just the most amazing jewel box compared to ours. Uh, it's I don't even think we have a jewel box in the north. What is our jewel box? Oh no, in the, the beehive, atmosphere? maybe. Jewel box. The beehive. Yes. Well, it's a beehive. That's. You got a beehive, and then you have a jewel box. That jewel one of box them can jewel sting you. Is, one of them's just flat out. The beautiful. other one will burn your eyes out of your head. It's so good. The southern one, it, it was just mesmerizing. The colors and the brightness, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. You have to see it. You yeah, it, it's on my list of uh, things to see mm -hmm. when I finally get to see Cesar and Maxi um, when I save my pennies. It, it will happen. My, uh, my what, what, uh, Cesar, did you want to, uh, do we want to uh, transition yes. to another speaker and then you come on? Yeah. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I'd, yes I yeah, I'm ready that, to go. Yes, Scott, I've got my, uh, I've got my I slideshow try. ready. Yes. I, you I got it already, only, Adrian? Yes. Okay. I yeah. need only 10 minutes because the polar yeah. line is very good. Uh, we can, I can make the process fastly, maybe in, in 10 minutes, because it's only okay, uh, a go-to go process. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll okay. let Adrian do I see you in 10 minutes. Yeah. Yes. yes and then uh, yeah. come back to you. You okay. got this. OK. Yep. <laughs> Let's see. Where is, here we go. I will do, um, so as Scott has said, I will, um, briefly show a couple of new slides I've added to my Chasing Dark Skies presentation and then show a slideshow. I put music to it, but I won't play the music just because of the the streaming regulations. There could be some issues mm -hmm. going there. So what I'll do is I will start. Were you playing James sure Brown? The, or? No. No, I wasn't using James Brown for that. Oh, that's a good <laughs> idea for a future that's a good yeah. idea for a future uh thing so what i want to do now is figure out why my slideshow man we got running technical difficulties here yeah we do i'm just going to exit the pages and close some things down let's see if i can okay we'll just we'll just abandon the uh we'll abandon the sl <laughs> this page <laughs> this page is having a problem <laughs> no kidding oh okay. yeah so what we're gonna see here is a progression of the night sky i've taken all these pictures um i've realized that over the couple of years that i've done my imaging i've actually taken enough pictures to show a rolling sky now this is northern hemisphere i can show a rolling sky where we start with the setting of orion and we end with the rising of orion and in the middle, we're looking to the south and looking to the southern part of our skies in the northern hemisphere. You'll see how it goes from the Orion region here. Um, this is like winter. How we go from here to the springtime, the rise of the galactic center, how it stands on end and how it rolls over to the northwest and then the Cygnus region dissipates and as the Cygnus region's dissipating we see a familiar face rising again in the um, southeast and we see Orion return there was me there is music to this but like I said I won't be playing it so I'm just going to let it go and what I'll do instead is I'll kind of direct now you got zodiacal light Orion's over here in this image in this image you see Orion setting this is west so you can see the progression, Milky Way flattens, then it rises up and then this bright region, Cygnus, and then you get a glimpse. There's the core coming up. And I know these images are going fairly quickly. I can actually, because I'm doing this, I can actually stop and we can spend some time. This image is one that I really do like because um, I was able to get the lighthouse. I was able to get some detail and look at this galactic center just 
You know, it, it's one of those where it's both the star and the background. You're seeing M8 and this light pole. Um, you know, M8 is as big Lagoon. at its distance as this light pole is from the distance I was standing, yeah. which is obviously this is a lot closer. And, um, you know, the that you want to talk about how big things are. Um you know, I know the theme being Big Bang and origins of things. A lot of a lot of what I do with my images is just to show kind of the magnanimity, if that's a word, how large these structures really are, you know, and <laughs> you know, that's our galactic center that we can see, and we're in this galaxy. So it just gives you just kind of gives you perspective of how large these things are. And so as we move forward, now there, you've got the entire galactic center rising. And this was taken in our upper peninsula in Michigan. At, at the time, it was the most impressive sky I had seen. And the most impressive, most of this was naked eye visible. Some of the detail I've got from, in fact, I think I actually overexposed it a little bit here. Um, Can you make a whole galaxy with a uh, different time of the year and combine them and make one giant like connected galaxy? I guess you, you might can. Have to Somebody has done that and they actually went from the northern to the southern, the southern. hemisphere. Yeah, to that's what do I do that. Um, and they connected the entire thing. So you had from the Orion region, Ada Carine, the Magellanic Clouds, the Southern Cross, Centaurus, hmm. and then on into what we can see from the Cygnus region, Cassiopeia, um, this region with Scorpion and Sagittarius. There's the Scorpion, there's Sagittarius as it rises. This is the time of year, Northern Hemisphere, when it's standing like when it's rising, you might get a glimpse of some more of these nebula, the prawn, the uh, lobster tail, like it has another name. And you can the see the pond. horse. You the horse can, there. yeah, like right. the blue horse head, yeah, the blue horse, yeah, this part you can see yeah. that well, but um, it's these that disappear pretty quickly as the Milky Way rolls, and we're going to see that as we progress. You notice the angle starting to get higher and higher as we get into spring and we're headed towards summer, and now these these times look at this this is actually fall i actually jumped ahead a little too quickly um but yeah it it stands on end this one's a pretty special i'll go ahead and describe this one i wanted to recreate the first time i saw the milky way naked eye and it was at this location this cornfield and so there i was standing there and i i recreated the shot um just standing there looking at this misty stuff i didn't know all of this was a part of the milky way that you can actually see in the picture but there's this mist steam they call it coming from the teapot the teapot right here and you know there's a little bit of steam when i got here naked eye i could tell that the uh, milky way was here but and then of course planes always come and ruin your shot but that's okay um I could tell that it was there. And so when I set this up, you know, this is this is where Sagittarius was rolling, and this is where um Milky Way was. And I just sat there and looked at it. I didn't have a telescope, I didn't have this camera, which I would later come two, three, I forget how many years, um, to recreate the event. Um for two minutes, I tried to stand as still as I could and didn't turn out too bad. There's a little bit of blurriness in my back here, but I stood still for two minutes to create this part of the um, shot. And then I took a two minute shot and there's the structure to Milky Way. There's the butterfly. There's Ptolemy's cluster. Um, they, even though this zone the portal is probably in five or six. If I were to if I were to have an SQM meter, 
it's still with two minutes, I'm still able to get some structure of the Milky Way here. And so that for me, you know, it was nice to be able to recreate this moment that kind of started my chasing of the Milky Way. And so as we move on, you see, even with the moon here, parts of the Milky Way are coming up. This, my other northern, my uh, northern upper peninsula of Michigan shot, the dust lanes, everything really clean. If you look, there's like Barnard's E, which is really clean here. And there's a lot of sky glow this night. I also did not have the uh, SQM-L meter to know exactly what the reading would have been. I suspect it would have been 21. closer to 21.6 or something. It would have been a pretty good reading because even with these clouds here, it was it was pretty transparent. And then we get into here where it's not so bright. These are some earlier images. I caught a meteor here. And now this is what the Milky Way looks like naked eye at Okitex. Any dark sky. You've seen this, I'm sure, John. Um, That's really, it's that dark there, really? It is that dark. There's no sky glow anywhere. Well, you can't there. see it. You can't see it naked eye as well here. This is... <laughs> This is as accurate a representation, you know, minus the plane, yes. what you see with your eyes. Now, what you see when you edit it. Yeah. Is that the like trip or the lagoon? That's the lagoon. Wow. This is an edited version. Now you can see some of the sky glow. In fact, you see there's a lot of greenish color here, a lot of sky yeah. glow. Right. That's when you, you spend time, you know, now you've got like a two minute. I want to say this is actually, this may actually be a 30. No, it's probably a two minute image because I've got some like the handle That's here. Weird. You know, this is, this is, there's more detail. There's M23 right there. There's M22. Look at that. You got um, M24 and you got M8. And look at this red, a little bit of M20. There's M6. There's M7. And I did manage to catch, you see a couple of the, uh, couple of paw prints here from the cat's mm -hmm. paw and a little bit of nebulosity from the lobster claw here. So this was a, um, yeah, this is, this is Oki text when you process it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's out there. It stands on its end in the sep September going into October. So now you're seeing the Milky Way oh, rolls cool forward. Shot right there. Yep. So now we lose the core. And as we get into fall and we're heading the late part of fall and winter, look at what's happening. Here's, you see the, there's some coloration on the trees and look what's happening. Cygnus is now starting to pull itself down towards the horizon as the whole Milky Way moves, the plane of the galaxy moves towards the northwest. And there it goes. There it goes again. And this was uh, in earlier. And now we have, as I'll point out, there is Deneb, Seder, and then that whole region. I don't recall these stars. Alberio is in this haze over here. And we're pointing at Cygnus as it drops the last vestiges of summer. The summer Milky Way is already gone. Um, or the summer, we call it the summer up here in the Northern Hemisphere. You see there's ice on, there's ice out here in this bay. So we've transferred from fall towards winter and as the vestiges let me go stop this because as the last vestiges of summer are sinking and this was the only shot that i took where andromeda shows up um this whole region with cassiopeia is pretty much goes circumpolar we could see that but my focus on the slideshow was you know more of the regions that we see in the summer and then the regions we see in winter so as we lose cygnus region orion returns 
And this is on the other side while Cygnus is setting Orion is now rising and now coming up out That's of the like haze. That's like October, right? Maybe October. Yeah, this is like in October. This could be a it could be a September shot too. A lot of mm -hmm. these shots were set that you're going to see were rising. actually yeah. September at 3 in the morning, 4 mm -hmm. in the morning. You know, I had to get up early to get them. They as, you know, as October, November, December this starts happening earlier at night. And see, here we go. Here it comes. This is it rising. And I'll pause. This was a this is a proud moment of mine when Skies Up used this image. It's a pretty rich image. All this is Orion's all dressed up. And um, you can see the California. That's your there's your nebula, John. Yeah. California. There's the Pleiades. You've got other nebula here that if I get it by, you know, there, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And then these dust lanes that are here, this other side of the Milky Way, which, um, you know, I would challenge more of us that like to do the wide field type shooting to take advantage. If you've got a pretty clear sky, you know, see what you can do to get this because it's it's just as rich in stuff. It may not H2, be as bright. Many H2 regions, like, yeah, uh, you know, like are. the M33, like you said earlier, and then uh, 101. So if someone was looking at our galaxy from a way far away, they would they, see them. Yep. They'd see all this here. Yeah. It's a great shot. Yep. So there's the Zodiacal light going the other way. Wow. Remember at the beginning it was going. And then... This slideshow ends with Orion now standing straight up. We're back. We're at thick of winter. And so the very next slide would go all the way. This is the end of it. The very next slide. Um, see, this picks, notice this picks up where that slide yeah. ended at the end. So, so that picks up. And now when Orion starts to set and you can see the um zodiacal. Uh, yeah, the spring zodiacal like going this way. Whereas the fall zodiacal light angles the other way. And Orion is around them both times. There is the spring. There is Orion. So Orion's around here somewhere. There he goes. And there was another, I added another one where it was faint. Yeah, coming out this from this building. And there's Ryan observing the zodiacal light. And on this way, um, you're heading towards the Cassio, Cassiopeia and Perseus. Wing. That's the Pleiades in there, right? This Pleiades. isn't. No. Yeah. This oh. is let's see if I I want to say that this is Cassiopeia right here. This is a wide angle yeah, shot. That's it. Yeah, I think it's Cassiopeia. And then there you got the double cluster. Didn't that's get the heart and the soul here, but yeah, because that's a the, the Milky Way didn't show up super well in this shot. But um the that's Barnard's what we're looking soup. at. Barnard's yeah, soup. Barnard's in the soup. <laughs> yeah there's no yeah barnard's loop shows up in this one yeah because i get uh whoops yep and a rosette right here that's a really wide field yep uh, yeah cassiopeia shows this is cassiopeia right here does the cold so, help your shots to, uh, give um you i think yeah. there's a little less thermal noise mm -hmm. when you shoot, it you shoot it's already cold yeah, yeah. It, it's picking up, you know, this is a, this is a modified camera, so it's picking up a lot of uh, yeah. stuff. So now we, we had that presentation by Molly. Well, there's the heart right here. You, you don't see nearly as much detail, but it's right here. Soul next to it. You know, you had Cassiopeia over here. Perseus, this is actually Malat 20, this group of stars huh. here. This uh, that's actually uh, it's a named star cluster, and there There's is a little bit of an Easter egg here. You see this little part? Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. That is E3. Comet 2022 E3. Right. It was when it was in Taurus. I can see. Yep. That, uh, There's yeah. Taurus. Right. There's the comet. There's Mars. Mars. I this got a was, similar. You have a similar. Well, um, not like yours. Yours is like really good, man. Yeah, I mean, this is like a. This is a. Yeah, this was a stitch panorama, and it was a. It was a pretty good night, so I was able to get. You know, all yeah, this. it has a tail. Your comet. It looks like a very small. Tail. Yeah, there's a very small tail right here. Wow, amazing. Yeah. There you go. So. Well, that's great. Yeah, well, so looks like uh, Caesar has uh, got his all right. back up and running at this point. Yeah, and that's that's this is a good place to stop the presentation. Um, one of the places I shot was um, I originally measured it at twenty one point two. I went back there and it measured at twenty one point four. So mm. some of the places where I've captured readings the plan is to go back and get more readings and um, find out if, you know, what the average is over a course of clear nights and not just, sure. um, not just one or two nights here or there. Um, Cause my, you know, there may be an average that's higher than I think it is, which, which is better. I, it's 21.4 is still four tenths lower than what yeah, what the dark sky map says it should be so right yeah you know, we're still losing light but we i was pleasantly surprised we didn't lose as much we weren't losing as much light as i thought we were but you know that's still down from where it was in 2015 so mm-hmm. so there's still a there's still an effort to preserve those night oh, skies yes. for cesar to do his work so i will jump <laughs> out and I work cesar yes, yes you your time yeah, we, everything is now working. There. No, again. no, I was, I was enjoying your your pictures. Your la- landscape are amazing, and really enjoy it. Um, I really, I really uh, had the the hope that you can visit us and take the I do too. skies here. Um, yeah, it, it'll take the, it'll yeah, complete you know. the collection that I've been yeah. gathering. It, <laughs> I it. That presentation, when I can finally get the Southern Skies, will be oh. one near and dear to my heart. It'll, yeah, I'll be able to complete all the regions of the Milky Way thing that I um, that I have. I'd be able to actually complete it with the entire the entire plane of the galaxy that we can see from Earth. So absolutely, you'll need hopefully. you'll need coffee for that because you're going to be <laughs> up for three weeks straight, probably. You know, yeah, I, I, I'd have to. <laughs> <laughs> One of my trips is going to have to be canceled in order for me to go to Argentina instead. So I got to I got to figure out what year I'm going to forego Oki Tex and I'm going to come to Argentina instead, because that's probably yes. what's going to happen. Now, now next um, in April, next month, we have the, the Pacha Grande Star Party. We are working a lot uh, in, in the, pre- the preparation of this and uh, what? We are happy to, to have this, and you are all invited. Um, any any question? Well, do you have my my contact, uh, and I can give you fast so fast as possible all about flies. Uh, you know the, the tickets or all uh, all you need. Rent cards, rent a car. Or, I, Look I forward to it. Yeah, I'll definitely be in contact with you when the time is ready. So, oh, so of course, of course. I, yeah. I know, I know, Adrian. Well, I'm again here. <laughs> I, I, as I told, um, tonight is a windy night, one, <laughs> as uh, many, many times, of uh, 100 km, uh, miles per hour, uh, Caesar. As you told me, um, but I I chose for na- for tonight a 